Well, first of all, thank you for saying I have muscle. That's how it starts Everybody knows that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I look at I look at myself like ah, oh, more. These are, these are leftovers, you know. Would you hate yourself if you walked into a gym and met yourself now, when you were younger, like when you were going after the heavier weights? You'd be like, F this guy. And I think that's where a lot of people kind of get caught up in in the gym is they just they just gym. So all their own, their only context is oh, Tom Platts completely obliterates himself on a leg extension to the point where it's no longer a leg extension, it's just him sort of like- Looks like he's, he's just giving Yeah, there we go, there we go, there we go. Like, <laughs> <laughs> he just played that first part, he's just like, oh, oh, whoa, 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 he's still whoa, going. Whoa. What did you take away from John Meadows in terms of his training style and some of the things that he did that was beneficial because he was extremely intelligent when it came to training. Why have you uh, discontinued using barbells on a lot of exercises? Like, let's take that that forward head posture kind of shit that we see a lot. It's yep. like, oh, it's because your back is so weak. It's like, well, is it because your rhomboids are weak, your chest is so tight? Or maybe this position here, the head jutting forward is the most efficient position for you to be able to breathe. <laughs> There's no chin, motherfuckers. <laughs> <laughs> Calories in, calories out. Where do you stand on some of this? Oh, <laughs> if I have you eating in a calorie deficit, if I have you eating a thousand calories a day, on paper, you are in a calorie deficit. Your body will get that extra 2000 calories that it needs to maintain itself from body fat. I believe we should always be trying to, if we're trying to lose fat, we should be trying to diet as hard as we physically can. Get as much fat as you can, do it as aggressively as possible, as quickly as possible. The first five kilos or so that I dropped, I was eating a thousand calories. The next five kilos that I dropped, I was eating between 1500 to 2000 calories. But did the next five kilos take a little bit longer to drop? It took a little bit longer. And that's it, like as you get leaner, mm -hmm. you, because you have less available fuel in your body, you can't diet as hard. Okay, when you're at your leanest, you have the least amount of available energy on your body. You need to support that by putting more food in. Power Project Family, how's it going? Now, I want to talk to you guys about within you hydration specifically. They have This Is The Way, which is an amazing protein that tastes really f good. There's a fasting gum, but the hydration is very interesting because there's no other electrolyte supplement like it out on the market. It has 60 milligrams of magnesium, 320 potassium, 1,000 milligrams of sodium, but it also has 500 milligrams of aminos, essential amino acids, and then two milligrams of zinc. Two amazing flavors, blueberry lemon and a salted caramel. That's mm -hmm. you, Andrew. That is me. So guys, you, you know how important <laughs> electrolytes are? They help you perform better. You don't get cramps during workouts. And I mean, with the diets, you need good electrolytes. So Andrew, how can they check it out? Yes, that's over at markbellslingshot.com. And at checkout, enter promo code POWERPROJECT10 to save 10% off your entire order. Uh, links to them down in the description, as well as the podcast show notes. Yes, you can shoot it in your veins, <laughs> or I'd say... <laughs> oh, no. Fake natty. <laughs> I'd say go with half. See how you feel. Half. Well, you go with half. You can't half this. It's, well, just, it's just, you do it all. You said half. you were sensitive, so I want. I, I don't want anything to yeah, happen. He should do the whole thing. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think he could do the whole thing, but what, it's up to him. What's the dose in the whole thing? A lot. So of, of the actual Kratom. This one thing. No one's quite sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, so they have Kratom capsules too. You see that? Oh yeah. yeah this one this thing empty. is equivalent to like eight capsules. How much is in a capsule? 750 milligrams. Is in a capsule? Mm-hmm. So, so eight times 750. Grams. You know, I, it's like I, I'm, I'm not, six, not good at math. Six, six, six point something yeah, grams. Six yeah. grams. Okay, all right. Yeah. All right, I could, I could do that. Yeah. Do that. Still go Are we half. going? Yeah, we're going, but go with nah, half. Eugene, oh, we're going, we're going Eugene like, is so. a... He's a G. He's got it. All right, but go with half. Okay. Real G's <laughs> go with half. Real G's go with half. <laughs> down the old hatch. Mind bullet to the face. And down the hatch. Let's see what the reaction is. Ooh, that's not tasty. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it starts off like, oh, this is delicious. And it's like, no, that's 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 mm -hmm. that's like licking a butt crack. <laughs> oh my goodness. Butt crack's tastier. Whoa. Yeah, did that go in? Yes, it did. <laughs> and yes, butt crack is tastier. Uh, that was, how how quickly does it take to to, <laughs> to kick in? <laughs> it, eight seconds. Yeah. No. It takes uh maybe about what, ten minutes? Yeah, it'll creep in. Yeah. You'll just notice You'll see me in ten minutes just sort of start drooling and like start twitching a <laughs> little you start foaming at the mouth. I'll take a bite out of your arm. Oh like, uh, shit. Not again. He's got rabies. You might notice that you don't even feel your peck anymore. Oh mm -hmm. disassociating. Mm -hmm. Okay. You're gonna, you're gonna in see the that. healthiest way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I uh, said to you when you walked in, I, I talked to you about the iced coffee that I got in uh, Australia. Yeah, yeah. What the hell's going on with that? They throw ice cream in the in the coffee? Look, that, that's actually news to me. 
I've seen it once okay. actually. Mm-hmm. Where done oh, it, you have seen it though. I'm I, not I, making I, it I have up. Seen, no, you're not making it up, but it's not something that I really Did I mess for. up and order the wrong thing? <laughs> you, you might have. You might have. <laughs> but maybe the story. Like, maybe yeah. I was just being fat. Maybe yeah, I was just like, hey, throw some ice cream in there too. They probably gave you the up and down, like, yeah, he's, yeah. An, he's an ice cream boy. Yeah, he's an right. ice cream boy. Exactly. They yeah. knew who they were dealing with. Right? Yeah. Um, but no, I'm too much of a coffee snob to go down that route. Mm. Like for me, I, I just like it pure. Did you have yeah. Temple Coffee today? Yeah, mm. I saw. Well, I saw the black and white cups. That's very snobby. Temple <laughs> Coffee is disgusting. <laughs> what I'm is sorry. wrong with you? What do you? I drink? know. You see, this is the <laughs> thing. You know coffee, and for some reason, people that know coffee love Temple. And I taste Temple Coffee, and I'm like, the fuck do you I, guys see in this? I hear, yeah, coffee. I'll say coffee snobs, but it's just like, oh, that tastes like acid. That's so good. <laughs> like, I, don't, I don't get it. Yeah, when it punches you in the face. <laughs> like, people oh, will. yeah, that burns. Fuck yeah. I'm like, that's not good. Well, what do you drink in Sam? Do you have like Starbucks? I like Phil's. I <laughs> see so you put me in the basic bitch category <laughs> immediately. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like you're like Starbucks. <laughs> like, Let me read. I like Phil's. Pumpkin Keats. spice. Um, I usually drink black coffee, but Temple Coffee, for some reason, I could never get behind it. And I, I tried. Cause like all the coffee people love it, but I was just like, I can't, I can't do it. <laughs> well, what's your, what's your coffee order? That's where we're going to start. Uh, yeah. Well, the, the, what if I go anywhere, I'll just see what they have and mm. I'll ask them for what the strongest coffee they have is. Right. That's just black. And then I'll okay. try that. Yeah. And then I'll just, if, if it's a coffee shop I go to, I'll just go down the list of what I haven't had. But Temple Coffee, mm. I haven't had a coffee that I'm like, mm, delicious. At Phil's, right? Phil's coffee. Phil's I've cool. had all of their. I've had all of their different uh, medium, dark, whatever. Yeah. I've liked them all, but Temple. Right. I don't know why. Have you had <laughs> Phil's before? I haven't. I haven't even oh heard of Phil's. Gosh. Is that a ch- another chain or is that like a it's one-off a chain, place? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, Phil's is amazing. It had like it. Um, it lists out the coffee and then it has descriptions of the coffee. As if the coffee is like wine, you know. Oh, for has, sure, like tasting notes. It's yeah, got citrus, it's, blueberry, chocolate. Yeah, yeah. yeah there you go, and, yeah. and so they have a lot of combinations of that. They okay. probably have what forty different coffees on the list, and then you can. They have like a secret menu type y- thing. Yeah, you can yeah. like mix and match oh, okay. them, and then they're they're really smart because in all their coffee they use heavy cream, and if right. you just get their coffee kind of like straight up the way they normally sell it, it's with heavy cream and honey. Fancy. Now you're having a goddamn party. Fancy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. really, if really you go good. that route. Yeah. All right. I've got to check that out then, Phil's. Yeah. Okay. Write that down. One, there's one really mm-hmm. close to here. So, okay. yeah, it's downtown. I, I can't do another coffee today. You're going to kill me, man. You, you got me on this kratom. You got me shooting everything up. We Mark, got some tea. He said that when he was younger, he used to do 16 shots of coffee a day. Wow. Not every single, most days. Most days. Of espresso. Yeah, yeah. It wouldn't be like, I, would, I wouldn't get 16 orders. It would be um, the triple or a quad shot. I would get because I really like mm-hmm. coffee. I like the flavor of coffee. I don't like a like a what do you call it like the americano. Yeah, I don't, I I don't like that because it's too watered down. I like mm-hmm. the I like all those different. I think wine espresso is a great way to go for a lot of people, especially people that have a hard time uh, drinking coffee without putting a bunch of stuff in there. That, yeah, a bunch of sure. es- extra calories for sure. So yeah, I'll do that. And but an espresso is so small, so you got to get three or four of them to make mm. it actually <laughs> last a bit more than a couple of seconds, so you can sip on it. You know, but I'll do maybe between three to five of those in a day of these triple the quad shots. Um, and I, I'm a small human. So it's like, that's a lot of caffeine to put into a small human. <laughs> and um, somehow I didn't die from that. Mm. But that should have been a red flag of like, yeah, you probably, something's amiss. If you can take that much caffeine and not burst into flames as a small Asian man, it doesn't make sense. <laughs> when you start dealing with grams of coffee, then you know you're in trouble. So yeah. you're probably taking at least a gram every day. Possibly, yeah. And then now, like if I have one shot that's it could lead me astray i'll go down this dark vortex where i don't sleep for a couple of days <laughs> it's, it's, it's crazy have you ever been to italy before yes yes italy's kind of cool because they have uh like these espresso bars and you you like sit there and you like mm. sip espresso like while you're at like this bar but it's the second that you're not drinking they want you the hell out of there mm, yeah but you just sit there and you kind of like just talk trash and make fun of people that are walking by it's kind of fun yeah i do i do enjoy that i do enjoy that <laughs> Very much like people watching over in Italy. All those motorcycles zipping around. Yeah, little Vespas. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, that stuff terrifies me. I, 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 I had to teach myself how to ride a bike when I was a kid because um, I just didn't learn. Well, I learned it in, I remember in, in high school, we had like a school camp where you had to go, go mountain bike. And I was like, I can ride a bike, although I couldn't. Mm. So that just went really badly. And after that, I was like, I was scarred. Like, I've got to teach myself how to ride a bike now. So I started to learn how to ride a bike. But I've never like been com- confident on a bike. And then even around, now? Even now. Like I can ride it. Maybe <laughs> I wouldn't. I wouldn't get. I wouldn't get on a bike these days. I'm, but, gonna, um, I'm gonna kill myself. Did, did yeah. you guys That's see the feel. president of oh. the United States 
fallen on a bike? <laughs> no. Yes. No? Oh, I got to find it he, now. <laughs> he wiped out. He totally biffed it. <laughs> and he was at a stop, too. He was, like, getting ready for a pose, he's, smiling. And he's then he so just old. Oh. He just tipped over, huh? You'll you see it. Uh, it's a very Biden I'm type just of on YouTube. Hold on. thing. Sorry. Okay. Did, did where are you from it? in uh, Australia? Like, where were you? Where'd you grow up? Melbourne. So down, down the bottom there. Yeah. And that's where you're still... Yeah, yeah, still based there. Yeah, I've just lived there my whole life, grew up there, and I love it there. Like, I've tried. I've spent a little bit of time in Sydney, um, and I travel around Australia a fair bit, but Melbourne's always just been home. Mm. It just feels comfortable there. And then the more I travel now, um, the more I realize just how how good the city actually really is. Um, because I, you take it for granted we don't have the perspective of the rest of the world. And then you go to other cities, you're like, wow, this city is really bland. Or this city is really, I'm going to get shot probably. <laughs> this is like, you don't cross that street or you're going to get, yeah, stabbed in the neck or something like that. Um, or there's there's no greenery or things, mm. just little things. And never appreciated that. And But now I'm like, oh, Melbourne does, you know, have a really good vibe. It's got a really good culture. It's got a, a good amount of just variety to it. It's safe. It's clean. It's still not perfect. Um, I think I don't think I don't think anyway is perfect per se, um, but I do come to respect how lucky I am being in Melbourne and growing up there as well. Mm. You know, compared to a lot of other places that we've been to all over the world. It's we like, talk you know, about that quite a bit on the show. Like, this is like our job. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> kind of ridiculous. You know, we're we're very grateful. Yeah, growing up in Australia, my perception from never going there is that people seem to really care about fitness there. Mm. I think, um, mm. is that actually like, is that the case? Like coming to America, seeing food plates, how people are here, is it different here substantially as far yeah. as the, the health yeah. perspective? Yeah. I'd say, um, it's, it's a lot easier. It's a lot more accessible to be in, in the fitness, not in the industry, but just be, to be fit. Like things open up earlier. Um, like I know, um, over here, when, when we first got to New York a few weeks ago, we were trying to um, just find a place to get a good breakfast in the morning. Nowhere opens until like 10 a.m. or 11 a.m. Mm -hmm. And it's like, that's weird. That's weird. You can, you can get a coffee, but you can't like get a proper breakfast or something like that in the morning. But in Melbourne, you're going to have everyone, everything open at like 7 a.m. at the latest. Some places like where Katrina's from, she's, it's open up like at 5 a.m. Yeah. Because everyone's out and about. They're all exercising, they're all doing stuff, and they're all outdoors. Even though it does get very cold in winter, mm -hmm. there's just very much of this culture of being healthy, fit, and active. California's fucking lazy. <laughs> yeah. 10 a.m. for yeah. breakfast? <laughs> well, California, New York, Jesus yeah, it's all like Christ. Yeah. yeah, it's it's <laughs> yeah. it's weird. It's weird. <laughs> it's a shell shock for us. Is the weather in Australia similar? I mean, it's a huge country, but is it... Yeah, so I mean, it very, depends on where you're at. Like okay. in, in Melbourne, it, it does... Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't snow anyway, in, like in terms of the cities, um, but it does get pretty cold. Um, I'd say it's, um, yeah, it, it is probably similar to kind of California. California's mm. probably a bit sunnier, a little bit warmer, a bit, little bit more consistent. We have like big ups and downs. Mm. Um, I think actually probably the closest would be probably to New York, minus the cold depths of snow that comes in winter. Mm. Um, but yeah, where it is very transient, one day it'll be hot, one day it'll be cold, it'll be raining, cloudy. You get a, you get a big mix. I was watching one of your videos recently and you were talking about uh, hamstrings and, and how to kind of get the hamstrings to open up a bit. And we've talked a lot on this show about, you know, stretching versus not stretching versus, you know, activation versus dynamic stretches right. versus uh, doing myofascial release and this program and that program. And I liked uh, a lot of the stuff that you had to say. Um, I tried what you were talking about. And you were like, some people might be able to do, you know, what you showed obviously was like next level. I wasn't able to even do that, but I was able to do a scaled down version of it. What video is this? And I'm just trying to move. <laughs> I'm just trying to move my hip, just a hip flexor exercise. Oh, the, the pike pulse. Yeah, um, yeah. I'm yep. on the ground and I mm. just kind of lean, lean back on my hands and then just kind of move my foot off the ground. I guess you'd say with my mm. leg uh, extended out straight. I did like four reps, <laughs> and I just got this crazy cramp uh, yeah. in, in the hip flexor. And that calmed down, and then I got a cramp in my stomach, and then I like rolled over. I'm like, I'm getting my ass kicked. I haven't even tried anything yet. Yeah. Where did you come up with some of these uh, ideas? How, to, uh, where, how have you kind of stumbled upon some of this right. information? Yeah, I mean, I mean, that was not me coming up. That was stolen, completely stolen. Mm -hmm. I mean, 99% of what I want to do is plagiarized. People got to. I mean, people got to realize that's the fitness industry. It's yeah. not like deceptive plagiarism. You learn, but it's, it's you learn. <laughs> yeah. um, something like the pike pulse that comes from, well, from my lens, it comes from gymnasts, but a lot of martial artists use it as well. 
like they train their hip flexors mm-hmm. or doing that that leg lift. Mm-hmm. They'll use it a lot in like judo warm ups. They use it a lot in gymnastics. As Olympic well. lifting. Olympic yeah, lifting as well. Yeah, the they, a lot of times. Yeah, um, but yeah, that specifically that pike pulse. I first heard about it from Coach Christopher Summer, who was the uh, Team USA gymnastics coach hmm. many many years ago, and he was talking about this like what the, what is this exercise? And then um, he was talking about how humbling it is. Like it looks it looks like nothing. You're sitting there lifting your leg off the ground. How hard can that really be? <laughs> But then when you look at it from like the physiology perspective, like, oh, this is why biomechanically it's so fucking hard. Mm. I can swear, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Oh, I can't remember. Mm-hmm. Um, but I was like, it's, it's fucking hard. Um, and then you realize, oh, this is why it is so hard. And then um, because one thing is it's, you're putting your body into a very, very short position in terms of the muscle length where you're not going to have a lot of strength and you are going to have a heightened sensitivity to that crampy sensation, which is not the goal, but it can happen a lot of the time. Um, then I started to unpack it more and then like I've been through every single type of myofascial, fascial stretch, release therapy thing and I've had varying level, levels of success, of success with it. And what I started to realize um, over time was that all of these things are improving flexibility, mobility, um, not much is actually happening on a tissue level. And most of the research does actually show that where like most of what we do and like stretching, mobility, soft tissue, you're not actually changing much of the tissue in terms of quality or its texture or, any, or its length. Mm-hmm. Um, like there may be with extended stretching for a long period of time, you are going to get some change to the tissue length from stretching that has been shown, but it's very minimal. But really the way that a lot of these stretching things work is um, it's nervous system. It's all the brain. Like your brain is um, down regulating its feedback to say like, hey, stop going to that position. Um, and we've got to work, okay, why have you, why are you tight in the first place? Has your muscle become so bound up and knotted up and tight? Actually, it doesn't just happen like that. And if anything, it's more the brain saying, I don't trust your ability to go there for whatever reason. So I'm going to create restrictions in your movement, which you'll mm. sense as hamstring tightness or whatever. And then I'll restore that if I gain that confidence and awareness and whatever else it may be. Um, like something like the pike pulse, that hip flexor work, that works via more um, reciprocal inhibition, where in order to contract the agonist, like your bicep, your tricep has to relax. It's the same deal for the hip flexor hamstring. When you flex your hip flexor, your hamstring has to relax. So you have to feel the hamstring, well, the hamstring will loosen up. And for many people, um, you could ask like, why is the hamstring so tight? Like, is it because I'm not stretching the hamstring enough or is it because it's tight for a reason because they're pulled in a certain position all the time because their body senses um, whatever instability or weakness in inverted mm-hmm. commas um, in that area? And how can we restore that? What's the missing link? And don't look at it from the tissue perspective of the hip flexor or the hamstring. Look at it more so from a neurological perspective of what does your brain not have good awareness, good control over, and then how can we restore that? Mm. Yeah. What are some core principles like, for example, you know, we're talking about individuals who when they gain muscle over time, they become stiff, they become tight. So for you, Mm. you're large. Like you have a lot of muscle. People can see it on your IG. You've been training for a long time. Mm -hmm. But what within your training have you maintained so that you have good range of motion so that you don't get too stiff? Or are you stiff in certain areas? Do you feel like, because like with your training, you do a lot of different things. Mm. So how do you structure that for yourself? And what are you like? Yeah. What do you do in terms of practice that helps you maintain good mobility, good movement while you're continuing to improve your physique? Yeah. Well, first of all, thank you for saying I have muscle. That's <laughs> to Everybody knows yeah. that. Yeah. I look at I look at myself like ah, more of, these are, these are leftovers, you know. Um, <laughs> it's it, <laughs> it's, Le- it's leftovers from being bigger at another time, or leftovers from everybody else. I mean, like look at that. But you know, what people don't realize is is that video there is I'm 66 kilos, or it's 140 pounds. Mm. I got it's for me. That's not natty. <laughs> the, th- the thing is, like, um, I've got really good muscle bellies, proportions, structure. Like, I was made to do bodybuilding. Like, not to be Mr. Olympia because I don't have the, the height for that, but I was. I have that physique that's just like, oh, very pleasing to the eye. Where just the hop my, on and go to two twelves. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the way my muscles like attach to my body, just it just looks nice. It's always going to look. So I'm going to look a lot bigger than I actually am. Like the first reaction people always have is like, oh my god, you're so small. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> I am. You're like, thanks. <laughs> yeah. Like, what? Yeah. It's, it's a big come down for a lot of people. It's like, yeah, it's, it is what it is. Like, I know the angles, you know? I know the angles. I'm the lighting. Uh, I'm, I'm very good at that kind of stuff. Um, but the go to the question, like, of training wise, yeah, I have, I've gone through many different iterations of training over the years where I've realized, like, some things when I was, like, heavily into powerlifting, heavily into even bodybuilding mm-hmm. many, many years ago when I was competing, um, I had a lot of restrictions in movement. I wasn't doing, doing too well. And, 
Now that's very different. And I wouldn't say it's because I'm a lot smaller as to why that I am more mobile. I'd say that um, if I cared to put on that amount of size again, I could do that and maintain mobility or even improve it. Mm -hmm. Because if you look at, um, it's always, I don't like to always go to anecdotal evidence, say, look at these authority figures or whatever, but it is helpful. Yes. And there are so many people out there, even people like, like a Ronnie Coleman, okay? He's, you know, a bajillion kilos in his prime. He could do the splits. Like it wasn't a per it wasn't a perfect split, mm -hmm. of course, but you see so many examples of these incredibly muscle muscle bound people, but they can still achieve feats of yes. strength, or feats of mobility and flexibility. And you gotta say, okay, what's really going on there? Like, is this whole yeah. muscle bound thing a case where you have too much muscle, you actually can't scratch your eyes because your lats in the way? Mm -hmm. Honestly, it doesn't happen like that. Like maybe if you're running yeah. common, it might at that point. Yeah, it's I crazy. I know that. Like, if you actually really analyze that, is that really a split? It actually isn't really a split. Look how his, his left knee is bent. Yeah. It's actually, he's stretching out his right hamstring. It's Ronnie Coleman. Yeah. We all just give him the nod. For sure. Ronnie, that sure. is clearly a split. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Regardless, it is still impressive. Yeah. You know, it is still an impressive position to be in given the muscle size. And it kind of shows you guys that, like, yeah, being muscle bound isn't necessarily going to be like the default if you build more muscle mass, mm -hmm. you know? And you've got to ask, um, yeah, what is missing in some people when they do build muscle, they do build strength, what are the gaps in their programming? What are the gaps in the exercises that they choose that then leads them to eventually become muscle bound mm -hmm. or they're tight? And that's where we've got to unpack all the way to the start and say, okay, what causes not even the muscle stuff, but what causes you to be tight in the first place? What causes your average gen pop person who weighs, you know, a whopping 70 kilos, 150 pounds, what causes that regular Joe to be tight and stiff? And how does that then translate to someone like, like us who's got more muscle mass? Because it's, it's the exact same process. People don't, people don't realize that, but it is the, the exact same thing where um, it is all governed by the nervous system. Like the reason why your desk worker has poor posture or whatever, mm -hmm. it's because their nervous system hasn't been challenged to go to these different positions all the time. Yeah, It's the whole move it or lose it kind of thing. And the same move it or lose it kind of thing plays out with people who are very muscular, very strong. Just because you have muscle mass doesn't mean that you have um, acquired all the neurological skill set over all the different planes of motion. Mm -hmm. And if you look at like how we train, um, it's very sagittal plane. Yeah. Okay, it's front, Front. You never, we never go into the rotational. We never go into the transverse planes at all. Um, and from a muscular perspective, that's huge. We're missing out on a lot of muscles, a lot of the rotator groups around the hips, around the shoulders. Um, but also looking at it just from yeah, overall movement, joint, joint motion as well. We're, we're skipping over so much stuff. And it's not just that we're skipping stuff. It's that we're also overemphasizing certain things so much where um, we're getting very, very, very good in different positions, in different ranges of motion. So of course your brain is going to really learn how to keep you in in that mid range. Yeah. Like if you look at most of the exercises that we do in the gym, it keeps us, um, we, we do the big compound lifts, help build muscle, build strength, which are very good for us, very good for a whole host of reasons, but they still have gaps. They still have gaps. And we need to look at it saying, okay, what is it from a plane of motion? Maybe it is getting out of that sagittal plane and more into transverse or more into the frontal plane as well. But it's also looking at it from the perspective of, um, are we actually going to those planes, other planes of motion and challenging them and trying to gain strength and mobility and mastery in those positions? So I've identified that for myself and said, okay, here's how I can fix that. And it's quite simple, you know, a lot of it's simple. Like a big one that, I, um, that I've been working with the last few months that's on the top of my mind because I've been teaching it more in, um, in seminars on my traveling tour is like, say the shoulders, okay? Like the shoulder complex. A lot of people have issues with their overhead shoulder flexion. Yes position, right? And when you really look at it, you got to say, okay, how often do we really go into this overhead flex position in our training? And you say, well, yeah, we do. Like if or you do, just in life. In life as well. And we say, yeah, we, we do that in say a pull-up. We're down here. We do this in the overhead press. Okay. Like a thing that you can go, we do go there. But the real question is, are we actually in those positions? Are we being challenged to pull our shoulder back into flexion? And we're not. Mm -hmm. In overhead press, you're pressing a barbell, the weight's pulling you straight down. It's not pulling you in this horizontal-ish whatever plane where you've got to work on pulling back. Yeah. In a pull-up, okay, you're not being pulled back into that flexed position or into the extended position where you've got to pull in the flexion. So technically what happens is, yes, in, um, in training, we train our shoulders. We train the upper back muscles. We, um, we passively go into a shoulder flex position by a chin up or by an overhead press, mm -hmm. but we're never actively being pulled into this 
extended position where we have to work into flexion for the shoulders. Um, and that's where we've got to look at just putting in an exercise such as maybe like a, a, a face down trap three raise or yeah, whatever it is, or a cable just... raise or even a face pull, you know, all these same exercises because um, they're challenging you to actually go into the flexion position mm-hmm. under load. And if you look at like, that's a huge gap for a lot of people. And that's why like face pulls and exercise, hey, they're a cool exercise because it, it, it covers that gap. But then you look at it from the perspective of, okay, we have a face pull being a cool exercise you can do, <clears throat> but then how often how balanced is that in someone's routine versus the overhead pressing versus their bench pressing versus their pull-ups versus their rows. It, there's a huge disparity in the amount of volume and time they dedicate towards this face pull, shoulder flexion position, upper back stuff versus um, all the mid-range stuff. Um, so for one thing, yeah, there's going to be changes in muscle size, but also just neurological awareness, okay, where we're biasing one thing more, your body's going to get very, very good at that. Mm-hmm. And it will over time potentially restrict the range to other areas just from a pure safety thing. Doesn't mean you can't build muscle, doesn't mean you can't build strength, but there's a good chance it's going to have some gaps there. So a lot of the thing that I say is, okay, look, what are those gaps? How can I fix them? With what exercise or what positions? And then how can I uh, make sure that as I get better at my bench press or as I get better at my pull-ups mm-hmm. that I can maintain that? And it's, it's surprisingly simple because I'm saying just like, yeah, just do some face pulls. Great. Um, but then the people are like, well, I already do face pulls. Why does my posture suck so much? And that could be like the whole program. If you, who knows? It's a very, very long conversation there. Yeah. Yeah. I think a big part of what you're saying uh, is, you know, if you're going to do something like a bench press, if somebody has uh, a decent amount of strength on a bench press, they're going to do many, many sets. They're going to do a lot of warm up mm. sets. And by the time they get to their top sets, if they're a strength athlete and they do like a five by five, they just spend an awful amount of time doing a, yeah. a, an exercise uh, that is just working. Like you know, I know it works other parts of your body, but mainly the front part of your body, mm. and only in kind of one direction. And it's like, yes. how many face pulls, you know, do I need to do to kind of offset that? Yeah. And what I've been thinking about a little bit more. I mean, the answer would be like a lot, right? You have to <laughs> yeah. do a lot, a lot of fucking reps, uh, and other exercises, right, to kind of offset it. Yeah. But um, what I've been thinking about a lot more is like, wow, if we just if we just like run and we jump and we mm. throw, like running, jumping, throwing, skipping, all these things from just that have been around forever, a lot of these things can help solve a lot of issues, you know, especially something like throwing, you're, you're pulling the arm back. Yeah, for sure. And there's like an eccentric, concentric component to it. Um, even just throwing a med ball, you know, mm. just, just uh, doing stuff that's more sport related. I think can really help a lot of people just to kind of think about there's a lot of deceleration that happens, a lot of explosiveness. And I think for most of us, like we want to like look good. We want to be in shape and all that, but we want to be able to like move well too, you know, to be able That's to snap thing. into something. That's the thing. The, yeah. the question I have for you is, <clears throat> would you hate yourself if you walked into a gym and met yourself now when you were younger, like when you were going after the heavier weights, you'd be like, fuck this guy. Like the guy that's telling you not to use the barbell and yeah. the guy who's telling you, no, you got to do this exercise and you're over there bench pressing. <laughs> yeah. Would you be like, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. Leave me alone, bro. I can very much see how in that context you could, yeah, be like, fuck off. I don't <laughs> listen to you. Me personally, as a like Eugene, I actually be open to that because I've, my whole career, my whole everything, I'm always ready to be proven wrong and to be taught something. I like that. No matter who it is, I'd be like, yeah, cool. Like you've got no muscle mass. I'll still listen to you. I'll still want to hear what you have to say. Um, so, but I do very much understand how I could very easily, how or other people could be like, yeah, you got no fucking idea what you're talking about. I'm going to listen to you. You know, how, how, how dare you say this? Because I've got my context of I'm so jacked and you're not, or I've achieved all this and you haven't. Why should I listen to you kind of thing? Um, so yeah, it's it's a bit it's a bit it's a little bit of both. I'm just thinking um, about how like we would receive, you know, somebody telling us to yeah. like train our feet and train, <laughs> you got to train your tibialis and like all this, especially like maybe five years ago, we would be like, ah, oh, I don't think yeah. so. Yeah, <laughs> well, I mean, for me, like, yeah, five years ago, I was taught, I was teaching people about fit, teaching people about tibialis and stuff, and I was because I was excited about it. I think this is cool. This is interesting shit. And this is as much as I was like a bodybuilder, um, I, was, I was just more fascinated just by the human body, seeing what it's capable of and how can I get as much as I can out of it in, in any avenue because I don't want to be just a bodybuilder. I want to be able to yeah, live a long life, be mobile, be able to move, be able to do a lot of things beyond bodybuilding. And I think that's where a lot of people kind of get caught up in, in the gym is they just they just gym. And that's a big thing. So what you said is like, for sure, like a lot of these mobility or postural things, I think it's, in essence, it actually is a very, very simple 
concept. It's not necessarily easy, but it's just we don't move enough. Mm. You know, mm. It is this whole crisis. We don't move enough. And like even for me or even for, for all of us who are like we, we train, we train five days a week. What do you mean I don't move enough? I do my cardio every single day. I do my steps, do 10,000 steps and I lift weights every single day. I follow a really good program. But it's still not enough in terms of not more volume. But again, like it's those gaps. It's those gaps. It's like, hey, like you do jujitsu. Like that's multi plans, putting into positions you'll never experience in the weight room. Same as calisthenics, same as gymnastics, same as CrossFit. They're doing all these different positions um, that we never really go to. And I would say like that's um, that's that's exciting to me. That's exciting. That's where like, yeah, five, ten years ago had my, me today come back to me five, ten years ago and I was a lot bigger, more muscular, stronger. I would listen because I've been like, yeah, I want to learn how to um, – I'm excited for all those opportunities to be able to do shit beyond the gym. Unfortunately, many people just identify as I'm a gym guy. I lift weights and they get the ego. You know, mm. it's like, who are you to tell me when I've been doing this for so long, I'm so strong. I was like, well, yeah, but you can't scratch your ass out cramping up in your lat. You know, you're going to, you feel like you're going to pop your disc when you wipe your ass. It's not good. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, but you know, I've been there as well where you, you know, you feel like shit and then always want to find something better. Mm -hmm. I just want to improve that. I'm really curious about like uh, your training career over the years. Like you, mm. you kind of talked about that you were focused on bodybuilding, you're focused on strength. What did your training career look like from when you were a kid? Did you start this really young? Did your parents get you into fitness or how did it mm. start for you and how did it progress to where you are right now? Yeah. So when I, when I was, um, when I was a kid, I was always fascinated because I'm a, as you can see, I'm a small Asian man. I've always been the shortest. Mm. I even not, um, like I started school, like when I was a kid, um, like four, three years old or whatever, I started a year much younger than all the kids in my class. Mm -hmm. Like my kids put me into some kind of, my parents put me in some kind of accelerated program where I could just start school earlier. Don't know why. Um, but I was um, significantly younger mm. than most of the kids there by a year, if not a year and a half to two years. Damn. And so already I was set up to be like genetically, I'm a small structured person, but even then by having that actual age disparity as well, I've always been a small diminutive kind of person. So for me, it's always been like, yeah, I want to be able to do what these big fit kids do. I want to be able to play sports or whatever. I don't want to be the bottom of the rung, but I always was the bottom of the rung and I was a poor performer. Um, not necessarily from lack of effort, but just because like, especially in those developmental years between like five to 15 or so, mm -hmm. a year or two years makes a huge difference because the kids are developing so much. So I'm always going to be the weaker, smaller person. So I was always saying, I want to get stronger. I want to get bigger. I didn't know what bodybuilding was obviously, but I was always into like, exercising like yeah. i remember when i was you know like 10 11 years old i'd be just doing push-ups sit-ups in my gym or in my home not my gym <laughs> just at home yeah. and as soon as i could in high school i um i started going to the gym so when i was like 13 14 i started um training at the school gym and just trying to put on size and i needed to for the sport as well mm -hmm. like i had to put on, on like something in the vicinity of maybe 10 to 15 pounds or so just to meet the minimum standards to be able to do because i was doing rowing at the time to be able to actually fit into the constraints for the sport to do that and i was like fuck okay mm -hmm. so i've got to build muscle all the other kids who are older than me they're working on their fitness they're working on their performance i'm like yeah. i've just got to build um and it's always been the thing i've been chasing and then when i got out of high school um it was still very much that was what i was doing i was like i want to be bigger and then i, then I learned what bodybuilding was i was like ah. Oh, Bodybuilding is a sport and it's open to everybody. It's not just Arnold Schwarzenegger kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Anybody can do bodybuilding because there's all these local shows as well. And then I found a local bodybuilding coach and I started working towards that. And um, that's where um, I just got exposed to a lot of different varieties of styles of training. Um, like he was very, um, he had put me through a lot of like Mike Mensa heavy duty stuff. So I remember mm -hmm. very early on, I was doing all the four reps, the eccentrics, the negatives, like the, the painful shit, um, which is completely unnecessary. Like I, I, now I know like, oh, that was just fucking dumb. But hey, it worked as well. Um, but I had to go through a lot of processes through that of just learning how to push myself and train to build muscle mass. And we did a lot of powerlifting style stuff as well. Why do you feel that? Why do you feel it was unnecessary? Like the Mike Mensa absolute intensity mm -hmm. from what I know now in terms of the muscle physiology, how muscle building occurs and also like the whole... Uh, like he's, you guys had Mike Isretol on recently, the whole stimulus fatigue ratio. Mm -hmm. At some point, you are going to be creating that imbalance where you are creating so much more fatigue for the small amount of stimulus. And that's one thing that actually Mike Menster himself would say in his heavy duty manual. It was like, there are, there are two things that you're going to get from, um, from training. One of them is guaranteed and one of them is meh, maybe. So the one thing you are definitely going to get from training is you're going to get fatigue to some degree. You're going to use up resources, you're going to generate fatigue. And the other thing that you might get but might not, is stimulus. He was the first guy who said it. And, and then he was, that's why he would always, he was so big on um, 
pushing through failure to make mm. sure that you were getting that stimulus. But what we know now from a lot of literature and a lot of um, yeah, science is that you don't need to be going to that point to create the stimulus. And that's been a huge thing for me over the past probably five to 10-ish years or so of, of coming to terms with that because, and I think a lot of people can learn from that because a lot of us, we go to the gym and we start training and we, we start chasing the wrong thing. We chase the pump. We chase feeling tired. We, ch we chase feeling sore. We chase those last reps like, oh, I'm really killing myself and pushing to that point. And what we should be looking for is that we should be chasing a stimulus. But most people don't understand what the stimulus really is. They think the stimulus is that failure point. They think stimulus is you screaming and yelling and like mm -hmm. really getting that burn or whatever. And it actually isn't. Like those things sometimes come along to play with it, but they're not necessary for the muscle building. They're not necessary for many things, honestly. Like pushing to a complete failure point like that where you want to like puke and die, that's, an, that's important for its own rights of maybe improving your conditioning and tolerance to that pain or that hydrogen buildup, that, that lactic acid in inverted commas buildup. Maybe mental. Um, mental as well. It's a huge thing as well. Building up that tolerance, that's important for that. But if we're looking at it purely from the perspective of building strength or building muscle mass as two very nuanced goals, you don't need to train to those failure points. You've got to grind out every once in a while. Like you're going to do a one rep max test every once in a while. But like, you know, as a powerlifter, as important as a one rep max test is, how often would you really be doing that? Yeah, it's not a max. Yeah. You, you would hardly ever be doing a complete grindy out rep. You'd go into the gym nine times out of 10, knowing that what you've got to do today, and it's going to be hard, but you know, you can probably do it. And it may be a little bit of an ex of a reach every once in a while, but most of the time you're just going to get in, do the work and just progressively push that every single time. And they're going to be hard sessions, absolutely. But it's not going to be to the point where you're screaming, yelling, Tom Platt style, like just destroying yourself. It's not necessary. Not that it doesn't work, but it's not necessary. The tricky thing to navigate is there are so many people like a Tom Platt or like so many other people in the industry um, who glorify that mm -hmm. and say, this is what you got to do. And of course, they look the way that they do. People are like, that's the answer. <laughs> that's all they have as their context. Because they don't understand necessarily the muscle physiology or they don't understand the biochemistry or things of that, the mechanism of how we actually build muscle, how we build strength. So all their, own, their only context is, oh, Tom Platts completely obliterates himself on a leg extension to the point where it's no longer a leg extension. It's just him sort of like mm -hmm. bopping his body. I don't know if you've seen that video. It's, it's hilarious. Um, <laughs> but, that's, but, yeah. they're, but they're like, um, but, but that's what they think you're, you're meant to be doing. But if they eventually went to that point where they learned about some of the muscle physiology, some of the stimulus stuff, some of the biochemistry and how muscle building, strength building occurs neurologically and within the muscle tissue itself, they'll realize, ah, oh, yeah, that is overkill. That is not necessary. Um, and you can make a lot of progress without going to those points. Um, but of course, you have those nerdy conversations with a lot of people. They're like, shut the fuck up. I don't care. You're a fucking nerd. You know, Tom Platts looks like he does. You look like you do. I'm going to go with Tom Platts. Yeah, this, this is this is the stuff. Like, I hope looks like he's just giving. Yeah, it there, to we there we go. There we go. There we go. He just played that first part. He's just like, oh, 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 he's still going. He's still going, and it's and he would do that on every single exercise. <laughs> he's starting to get an erection too. And yeah, getting a, little, <laughs> getting a little awkward. Hey, yo, now, Tom, I got to go work out. And you take the average. Those person. are some wheels, though. Yeah, I mean, you see his yeah. legs, you're like, yeah, that's what it takes to build those legs. And then, but then the smarter you get, the more savvy you get, which only comes through experience and time and obviously nerding out on some of this stuff on a, um, on, on a very nerdy level, you realize that, oh, like his legs look the way they do, um, not because of he had to go to that point all the time. And going to that point is probably going to be counterproductive for most of us. He's an anomaly. And just because he did it doesn't mean that we all have to follow suit. And this is the hard part about, especially in social media. You're age, trying to find like the almost like the minimum effective dosage in some way, right? That's what we should be doing, and then progressing that over time. And yeah. we shouldn't be saying like that's what the goal is, and like that like like the Tom Blasting is the goal because it shouldn't be the goal. The goal is not to get tired. The goal is to do what we can to stimulate muscle building. Maybe go a little bit beyond that to make sure we're just to make sure we're really stimulated muscle building. Mm -hmm. And get out, recover, rest, and then make sure you can come back tomorrow and do it again and progressively do that. Like you do a session like that, how how frequently are you going to be able to train? Probably not very. Unless if you are Tom Platts or you're on, or you're on a ton of gear. But even then, you know, a lot of guys on a ton of gear doesn't, doesn't really make a big difference in terms of them being able to perform again and again and again. That's why they wind up broken. 
And, you know, when it comes down to really succeeding in anything, whether it's bodybuilding, powerlifting, jujitsu, anything, the one common denominator above all else is just time. The longer you can do it and staying injury free and progressing that, the better. And this is a big part of it. People are looking at all these. Um, I think this is kind of interesting for me is um, people are so focused on recovery tactics, mm. cryotherapy, the massage, the red light therapy, the laser therapy, all these different ideas. And they're all incredible. They're all, you know, a lot of these things have got a lot of risk about backing them. But no one's talking about the most fundamental thing of just saying, hang on, instead of trying to recover first, why don't we look at what you're doing in the gym first? So you don't, maybe you don't need to have as much recovery shit. Like you're trying to make up for a really shitty training program or a really shitty idea on what it takes to actually build muscle mass. Mm. You can't out cryo a poor training program. You know, you need to make sure that you're doing things intelligently um, to stimulate what you want and create some fatigue, but don't dig yourself into this deep, deep, deep ditch, deep ditch that you have to then try to pull yourself out of through every single type of recovery modality there and trying to find that silver bullet. The silver bullet to success really is smart programming and being focusing on your volume, your intensity, your frequency, your just your overall recovery in, in that perspective and managing that. That's the most important thing. But it's not sexy to sell that. It's sexier to sell cryotherapy or saunas or whatever else is out there. But And again, like not to bash those things. Those things have a ton of benefits. And mm -hmm. I, I love to use those kinds of things. But they should be the little extras on top after you're focused on the big rocks that are just, hey, are you managing your volume appropriately? Are you thinking about linearly progressing that? Or are you just going in and throwing everything at yourself and being a Tom Platts in the gym every single session? Unfortunately, like that's, that's where most people live. They just live in that intensity zone. And when you look at the other side of this is um, when do most of us start training? When did you start training? Yeah, when I was a kid. Yeah, like yeah, young. 13, yeah. How about yourself? And 13. Say, yeah, like 13, 14. And the thing is, we've got no idea what we're fucking doing. And we, we can accept that. But for the first, like, say, even 10 years, so from 13 to 23, okay, you can do dumb fucking shit. Yeah. yeah you, can do, you can do the stupidest shit and you'll get results uh -huh. and you'll get quick results. One thing because of the age that we're in, like we're 13 to 23, you're, very, you're gonna develop very quickly, but also because we're still newbies. Mm -hmm. Like we're in those newbie gain phases. So you're gonna make incredible progress. And what that does is it creates this idea in your muscle, oh, this is, this is uh, what I'm doing is correct. And it creates this belief, this identity that, yes, I know what I'm doing. And then it's very hard to tell the 23-year-old guy, hey, what you're doing is probably not good. Because you're like, I've got 10 years of history of experience. You can't tell me based on your science and your research <laughs> that you know what you're talking about. I've got 10 years of putting on 50 pounds of muscle mass. Fuck you. Mm -hmm. And that's a hard thing to navigate because you're dealing with somebody's identity of what they know has worked for them. Mm trying to tear that down or not tear it down, but trying to break through that to help them understand that, hey, what you've done so far has worked, but to take you to the next level, you've got to do something different and maybe a little bit more savvy. It's, it's hard. That's why people get stuck in this phase of always being in that beginner intermediate zone. You can train for 30 fucking years and you still be a beginner. And people don't like to accept that. Mm. Yeah. yeah. No, you see that a lot with, uh, you see that a lot in bodybuilding with the individuals who have competed year after year mm. after year after year, and they look the same. They don't look much different. And yeah. I mean, there does come a point where your gains do slow down massively, but sure. you can be making a lot of the same mistakes, training way too hard, not recovering from session to session. It can be tough. But when you were talking about some of the forced rep aspects, mm. I, I noticed that there's a, there was a time a few years ago that you got the opportunity to do a lot with John Meadows mm. and John Meadows, he actually, I mean, I don't know the deepest aspects of his training programs because I haven't purchased them, but by seeing his videos, he did do some things with forced reps. He did do some things with different tactics that, I mean, like go into failure quite a bit. Mm. So what did you take away from John Meadows in terms of his training style and some of the things that he did that was beneficial because he was extremely intelligent when it came to training. Yeah. Um, so how did he use those tactics differently than the way that bros use those tactics? Yeah. He was methodical about how he put it in. Yeah, mm -hmm. like some of the hardest workouts I've ever done have been training with John. Yeah. Like he and I just killing ourselves in it. Um, and a lot of what people see with those sessions, I think, oh, it's how we always train. But we'll do a session like that, like some of these intense YouTube stuff, or whatever, that will happen maybe one set out of one workout out of a whole four-week block. I'd mm. also like to point out there's a factor that um, – it's still maybe unnecessary, but you may be choosing to do it. And it's just sure. better to have the knowledge, right? Because you just want to bro out sometimes. Well, that's a big part. And that's a big part that I think is um, 
that honestly disqualifies everything I've just said, which is like, hey, what do you enjoy? You know, the big part <laughs> is like, hey, if you enjoy that and you love that, that keeps you happy and motivated, keep doing it. You know, maybe you might want to tone back on it and maybe over time you might want to learn something a little bit, maybe more optimal or whatever. But honestly, the most optimal thing is what you enjoy. And if you love that feeling, fuck yeah, knock yourself out. As long as you understand that maybe it is hindering you long term, mm. that's cool. You know, we do a lot of things that hinder ourselves all the time. Why not? You know, it's just it's just part of living. It's just it's, you're on your own journey. Um, but yeah, John was extremely methodical. As much as we saw a lot of the intense stuff, and I've done a lot of intense stuff with him, it was very, very infrequent. And I still do push those points of complete failure and even beyond failure sometimes. But it will be more of a, a mental test for sure. It'll be because I love it. It'll be because um, I also want to know where my limit is. Like, how do I know? Like from the research, we say, hey, anywhere between one to five reps close to failure is going to stimulate muscle building. It's mm -hmm. going to be an effective set. But how do you really know where that is if you've never gone to that point where your eyeball wants to pop out of the skull <laughs> by the last rep? We've got to find that point every once in a while and we've got to keep going back there every once in a while to recondition ourselves because we forget, you know, we get soft. We forget what that really is and what it really is like to push to your limits. That's why I think it is still you know, something that I do use but a lot less frequently than what I used to do many years ago because um, I still think it's an essential part of training but it shouldn't be the mainstay of our training it's just a small tool that trickles in yeah no I, I I know it's the same thing like when I was younger I did a lot of stuff to failure but I learned partially because I, I worked with Alberto Nunez a bit and I, I learned mm. his style of programming mm. so I mean I I learned not to head there that often and what happened I was able to actually gain quite a bit more muscle because I wasn't fatiguing sure. myself yeah. way too much every single session um but it is very simple for people to get stuck in because it feels good. Yeah. Like you think you're doing a lot of work, but you realize that when you're going to failure so often or doing those workouts like that so often, you are limiting yourself on the total amount of volume that you could be able to do in that session if you just took a few reps off. Absolutely. It makes a big difference. Absolutely. And that, that's, that's, what, that's what it really is. So being smart about that. And, um, but you tell that to a 21-year-old kid who all they know is, I'm going to brow and be hardcore and scream and yell, pump my chest. It's, it's, a, it's a very hard thing. <laughs> it's a very hard sell. I hope that it does change yeah. um, and it gets easier. But it's it's no longer, at, honestly, at that point, it's no longer about how much science do you know or how effective you are as a communicator. Well, I think it's more about the communication. It's more about how can you disarm somebody and get through their ego mm. without like just tearing them down and being a dick. It's uh, It takes a very, very particular skill set of conversational skills and communication skills to be able to help somebody in that aspect. And that's what I've you know, had to learn a lot through my years of teaching, or even coaching when I was a PT as well, is 99% of that is just communication and helping somebody actually be able to get over the line and understand and apply what you're doing and enjoy it. Not just because you've got a gun to their head saying, you got to fucking do this or not. It's um, It takes, yeah, a different kind of skill set. We don't really see much. Why have you uh, discontinued using barbells on a lot of exercises? Um, bang, just straight to it. <laughs> <laughs> um, for me, a big part of his preference and a big part of his, like, it's is also like the, the, the knowledge around like, is there something that could be a bit more comfortable for maybe your wrist or shoulder elbow position by having more freely moving um, parts in like a handle or whatever. That's why I prefer to use them over barbells. Um, like if I'm doing a deadlift, I'm probably still going to use a barbell. Like that's what I'm going to use. I use a straight bar for a lot of deadlifting stuff. But if we're looking at say like the bench press, for example, we need to do a pressing motion. If I was a power lifter, obviously I'm going to use a bench press. But for any other goal, all we need to do is apply some kind of mechanical tension to my pressing muscles. And I'm going to use something that's most the most comfortable, that requires um, a lot less, honestly, technique to be thinking about. Like a bench press can be a very technical exercise. As much as you say, I was just pressing a bar off your chest, it can be very technical, especially when you get to the realms of like pushing a heavy, heavy weight. And the amount of stimulus you may get from having to, from using a barbell versus dumbbells, the amount of um, fatigue you end up accruing on that neurologically, but also maybe locally in the tissues themselves because of the positions you're forced into but on a straight bar versus dumbbells or something that's a bit more freely, like even a Swiss bar, maybe a bit more joint friendly per se. Um, that can help you get more stimulus with less fatigue, whether it's local in the joints or systemically. Now, I am kind of um, 
I, I flip flop a little bit because I, I say that I say things like that, or I say like, I personally avoid barbells, and I think for a lot of people they are overusing and overemphasizing barbells. But I also always make sure that I emphasize now because I didn't in the past. But say you know what the fact is, yes, there's going to be more joint stress and joint strain from a barbell versus a dumbbell because of how you're fixed in a certain plane. But is that bad? No. Okay, it is just the quality, and the body can adapt. The human body is resilient. So yes, there may be something less optimal from the alignment and the joint forces going from from barbell from a dump, barbell to a dumbbell or gymnastics rings or whatever it is, but the reality is we can adapt. And as long as you're smart about your volume, your intensity, your load management, your recovery, there's no reason why you can't just do barbells for the rest of your life and make a ton of progress for, for whatever goal. Um, but it really just does come down to the preference and I guess where you're at in your journey as well. Maybe as you get more advanced, you need to be more mindful of things like fatigue and stimulus. Um, it could also be preference based on maybe you've had a history of injuries from being probably not as mindful of your volume intensity, all that kind of stuff. So now you need to be a bit more prudent around um, managing the exercise around that. But the big reason why I why people see me as the anti-barbell guy is because I'm not necessarily anti-barbell, but I want people to be thinking deeper about the fact that barbells are definitely probably overemphasized. For some reason, there are this golden thing. Everyone has to do a barbell squat. Everyone has to do a barbell bench press. And I think that's cool. Now, I think it's a cool thing. I love those exercises. You know, mm. I love them to death. Like, that was what I used a lot when I was growing up as well. It's something I have a deep emotional attachment to. Um, but it doesn't mean that everyone has to do it. And the reality is that the flip side to this is if we pushed out the idea that everybody has to barbell squat, barbell deadlift, barbell bench press. They're the king, the big three exercises. That, that's something that a lot of gym goers will connect with. But what about the people who really need our help, which is the gen pop, which is the people who aren't gym goers, people who don't have the strength, the mobility, the awareness to be able to do those exercises. You're telling them they have to do a barbell squat or that should be the thing they work towards. Otherwise, they're a failure and they're not where they, they need to be with their training. That's very limiting and it creates barriers. So... This is where this is why I say I flip flop because me also saying or getting the message across that hey maybe barbells aren't the best thing all the time that can also create a barrier. This is honestly an internal battle that I have in my head the entire time with the communication because I want people to be thinking that yes barbells are cool but they're not the be all and end all. But I also don't want to fear monger around exercise. I don't want to say hey barbells going to trash your elbows and trash your shoulders because they're not necessarily going to do that. It's more the lack of recovery and the load management is going to fuck that up more than anything else. It's a very tricky thing to navigate and I definitely go on either extreme occasionally which is I'm learning to communicate that more effectively um, but my big thing is trying to shift away the focus from yeah saying this is what you must do all the time and saying no uh, unless if you're a powerlifter or unless if you're a barbell athlete who has to use those certain exercises you don't need to use a barbell for the adaptation of getting stronger building muscle mass getting more powerful speed sports performance or whatever Unfortunately, people think that's what you have to do. I don't want to get my the other. That. The other thing I like about just some of that notion is um, when you use dumbbells, it it uh, has it has its limitations in the sense that like you can only like grab so much weight, mm. you know, and then therefore uh, you're most likely going to use a higher rep scheme. And we've talked about this on the show before, where something like dragging a sled, you know, you could yeah. you could do like thousands of reps but if you told me hey go in the gym and do a thousand leg curls or something like that <laughs> uh it would be it would be insane it'd be brutal but some exercises really lend themselves to kind of a higher rep range yes. and a person can most likely be safer for longer uh maybe not wear themselves out quite as much by just simply choosing uh to utilize exercises where you're using more kettlebells and more dumbbells mm. and things like that that's huge that's a big thing that i really um that I love to talk about is um, focusing on, don't don't think about the exercise determining what you're going to get in terms of stronger, bigger, whatever. You should be asking yourself, like the fact is you can do like, say for cardio, okay? Say I want to improve my cardiovascular fitness and I want to improve my conditioning. You typically think of going for a run, pushing a sled, maybe some kind of kettlebell complex or whatever. You wouldn't think of doing, because you can do thousands of reps of that. You wouldn't think of necessarily doing thousands of reps on a deadlift. <laughs> or thousands of reps on a biceps curl, okay? But the reality is you actually could if you wanted to. And there's no reason why you can't create a cardio-based program using biceps and triceps, and that's it. 
And that's going to actually need to be applicable for some people based on injuries and based on what they have available. But what I tell people to do now is just focus on what adaptation do you want? Power, strength, muscle building. They're the big things. And then that will then dictate a certain rep range or intensity scheme that you've got to then default towards, like higher reps for more conditioning, lower reps for more neurological strength gains and somewhere in between for muscle building. Um, and then say, okay, now that you've got the adaptation you want and now that you've got the um, rep range intensity scheme you should be playing with and the, and the failure points you might be working towards as well, what exercise makes the most logical sense? And there's going to be many times where a barbell is the best choice for that, especially powerlifting or especially like raw maximal hang on to a heavyweight strength barbell is going to be the best tool because yeah, dumbbell impractical, but there's going to be just as many occasions where a barbell is not the best choice or it's not the only choice. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I'm so outspoken about this is because the industry in my eyes is so emphasized on saying, no, the barbell is the thing, the barbell, they, they choose exercise first, not adaptation. The quote that we should be flipping around saying, yeah, you want, you want adaptation. What's the adaptation you want? what's the rep scheme or whatever that, that then predicates and then what are the available options you have and then you can choose whatever the fuck you want. It doesn't really matter that much. But you look at a lot of PTs on the gym floor, you look at a lot of coaches, you look at a lot of people running programs and just influencers, they're saying, no, no, they're going backwards saying, barbell bench press is what you got to do. And they just misapply it. And then it gets overdone and then that creates a barrier to a lot of people who can't do those exercises or feel like they have to, even though they don't, might not enjoy it or might not just be well suited at the current time for it. And that's where you run into a lot of problems. People think they have to do these exercises so much that they they feel like they have to do them with lots of pain. Yeah. Their and elbow hurts, their shoulder hurts, their knee hurts, and they're like, no, nah, I still gotta do my squats. Yeah. I mean, I remember like when I was coaching a lot of people, I would I would say, hey, you know, uh, it'd probably be a great idea next week if you just didn't squat. And they were like, what? Yeah. It's like, yeah, I mean, you're, you're training very hard. You need some time off. Your knee is like actually getting swollen. Mm. Like, let's maybe just think of some, like, come in and do some like leg curls and do some other movements for a little while. For sure. For sure. And it's, it's not like you're going to get weaker overnight. Yeah. But we have that fear. And the fear just comes from um, where our current knowledge set is, like where, where our current understanding, experience, knowledge is really at. And that's where, that's why, that's why I'm so big in education. Is that I try to be non-prescriptive and saying, here's what you must do. I say, here are the concepts that underlie, the principles that underlie it all. Hopefully that will then build their knowledge base to then be able to make the right decision for themselves. Because most of the people who come to you, like in the past when you were coaching and whatnot, all they know is squat got me huge. If I don't mm -hmm. squat, I'm fucked. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> they don't understand again, what's going on underneath. Like what, is it really the squat that made you so big? Or is it applying mechanical tension to muscles in a movement pattern? That's what got you big and strong. Squat is a convenient way to do that, with a barbell is a convenient way to do that, but it's not the only way. It's not the only way. Um, but yeah, this is why this is where a lot of the challenge comes from, is trying to educate that and bring up that up to people in a in a helpful way. Not I like it. I think, I think uh, it's great because you have a lot of folks that they might say something like, I really want to lose weight, and mm -hmm. then their method to lose weight is to go run. Yeah. But they didn't really they didn't really I don't know, they didn't really think of like the real intent and exactly you know, what the best way to go about that is. Because for, not for everybody, would that be a good decision? Yeah, absolutely. I, mean, I think running is a huge one. Like one of the things I want to talk about a lot is um, you know, running is a horrible choice for a lot of people. Um, just even taking out the technique side of it, where it is surprisingly technical, um, oh, yeah. but just, just the impact, the amount of volume you might need to do to improve like whatever, like if, even just for cardiovascular fitness, the amount of volume you might need to do on that creates a lot of impact. And maybe you would be able to accrue more volume using something less impactful, maybe like an air bike, maybe like a sled, where you can get the same amount of volume, if not more volume, with less of that stress on the joints. Not because joint stress is bad, but because we care about pushing up that volume. Like time and time again, the, the, another one of these unifying things, apart from like training for a longer time that's going to help you succeed more, is just if you can accrue more volume, okay? If, if we can take your identical twin and we put them through three times the amount of volume and they don't burst into flames, we know they're going to be a better version of you. Mm. And that's the denominator. So we should be choosing the exercises based on what's going to allow you to do the most volume that's going to help drive the adaptation the most with the least impact on recovery demands. And there will be times where say running may not be the best choice. If you want to challenge your heart and your lungs, you can do a bajillion different things that may be less impactful and that can help you accrue that volume that you really need. 
you know, I've uh, seen you recently, uh, I've seen you like in Vibrams. And yeah. I was curious, how long have you been, you know, wearing those types of, sh like those, those shoes? And then also yeah. how long have you been kind of focused on improving your feet? Has that been something that you got on a long time ago and you were yeah. on top of it? Yeah, I used to get ridiculed so much. <laughs> like yeah. literally about, it's been maybe, what are we now? It would have been about 10, 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. Like, um, around 2010-ish or so within the first few years of being a trainer, yeah. I started looking really deep into the feet. I started looking really deep into like being barefoot. And it just, it just felt good as well to be barefoot. Not necessarily the vibrance per se, but just being barefoot in general. And they were mm -hmm. just a good option for it. Um, and yeah, I used to get ridiculed. <laughs> People say you're focusing on this on this minutia. Um, like I said, I know you guys do a lot of uh, the mouth taping as well. <laughs> yeah. I used to get ridiculed so much for caring about breathing, caring about nasal breathing, caring oh, you were about doing that a while? About Good. 10 years ago. Like I, nice. I, I, I brought out my own, I don't have any here, nasal strips. <laughs> <laughs> I started making my own just because um, I thought I'm using them anyway. Might as well put my brand name on them. Mm. Why not? So I ordered 100,000 <laughs> units of them um, <laughs> back in 2011 or so, 2012. Um, and I was getting so ridiculed. I was like, this helps me sleep, helps me breathe, helps me perform, helps me, gives me a boner in the morning by having a <laughs> mouth tape. Um, these are things that people, like it's working for me. And just because it works for me doesn't mean it's the, it's the one thing, of course. Let's just um, back up a second and talk about this boner. <laughs> <laughs> in SEMA, I know you've been diving into this a lot, not just boners, but uh, the nitric oxide, like I think you might know how to explain it a little bit. Well, I mean, like when you breathe, you don't produce nitric oxide when you're breathing through your mouth. Mm, like it only yeah. happens when you're breathing through your nose. And that helps with a lot of different functions in the body, cell um, like cellular repair, getting oxygen to the muscles. It's easier and it's better when it happens through the nose. Now imagine if you're snoring at night and you're not getting any of that production. Because, no boners for you. Mm. I mean, it, it's it's... I wouldn't say you won't, like you absolutely won't get a boner, but breathing through your nose at night helps with a lot of other aspects in terms of recovery while you're asleep. It makes a big difference, which is why like we like the mouth taping, um, which is why we focus so much on nasal breathing in general. And it's it's something cool because I think more people are are becoming aware of how big of a difference breathing makes for them. And I'm really curious because you understood this in 2011. Yeah. I just started understanding this in like 2016, 2015. So why, like, we were just talking about feet, but let's like feet and breathing. <laughs> what got you on this train so early? My, um, my, my brother, um, so I'm the youngest of three. Mm -hmm. my, my brother's a dentist and he's not just the average dentist, but he's a... Ah, oh, this is exciting. <laughs> yeah. He is a TMJ specialist. So it's all about jaw. It's all about improving jaw pain, neck pain, and also mm -hmm. a lot of postural stuff. Mm -hmm. He's done some fucking crazy ass shit to people, especially like in kids when you're developing a lot, mm -hmm. where like, let's take that, that forward head posture kind of shit that we see a lot. It's yep. like, oh, it's because your back is so weak. It's like, well, is it because your rhomboids are weak or your chest is so tight? Or maybe this position here, the head jutting forward, is the most efficient position for you to be able to breathe mm -hmm. and align your airways through your mouth because maybe your jaw hasn't developed properly because you weren't breastfed as a kid. You were formula fed instead, which is a different suckling motion mm -hmm. on a bottle as opposed to a nipple, which creates a change of development of your jaw, yeah. which predicates you do not have a chin. <laughs> There's no chin, motherfuckers. <laughs> <laughs> And, and that is why you have this posture. Uh -huh. it's, it's, it's a very, very different, um, different conversation. And it completely blows up a lot of what we talk about when it comes to, oh, your bad posture is because you haven't done enough face pulls, you know? Mm -hmm. And this is like, it, it kind of counters what I said before in, in a way, but it doesn't count. It just looks a layer deeper and saying, neurologically, why has your body decided to put you in this forward head position? Mm -hmm. Is it really because you sit at your desk too much? I'm sure that plays into it. Is it because your back is so weak? I'm sure that plays into it as well. We're not discounting those things. But maybe the, the one of the other things you're not paying attention to is, yeah, your breathing mechanics. Yes. Like how is your body best aligned to be able to breathe because of maybe it's a sinus issue. Maybe you have your turbinates are inflamed all the time from allergies and mm -hmm. that predisposes you to then be more in a forward head position. Maybe it's your actual jaw, jaw to jaw development, that your jaw isn't like, yeah, wide enough to allow for your teeth to grow properly, creates a lot of yeah. impaction there. So he really like, he was big on, he is still big on that. And it's, it's very, 
it's mind boggling to see some of the before and afters he can create, especially in kids because they're still growing, mm -hmm. but in their posture, just from giving them different um, dental splint devices that help to realign their jaw. Yeah. And what it does is it improves the development of their jaw, which naturally pulls them into that ideal posture in inverted commas because they can now breathe more comfortably. Mm -hmm. And no amount of face pulls, no amount of chest work or chest stretching was going to fix that kid per se it's because it, it's a breath thing. And, you, and the breathing is number one because if you don't breathe, you fucking die. Mm -hmm. So like who cares how strong your back is if your body still can't breathe, it's going to push your head way forward to align that airway more comfortably to let you breathe through your mouth because you can't through your nose for whatever developmental reason that may be. Mm -hmm. And and that was just like, that was mind boggling to me. Yeah. Um, and then the more I, I looked at it with people, the more I realized how many people struggle to breathe through their nose. Mm -hmm. They struggle because, and it could be a deviated septum. It could be something in terms of allergies and inflammation. They could just have smaller sinuses in general, just from, from birth. One for of whatever the biggest things reason. people say is like their allergies. Like they yeah, just can't breathe through their nose. Allergies is huge as well. Mm -hmm. And all these things can have just as much of an impact on the posture as training your back and having a two to one push pull ratio, whatever people talk about. Like those things, are, they're sexy sales things. Um, but it's not really not always going to be really fixing the real problem. Yeah. And you know, that, that's where I look at and say, what's really going to fix a problem? And like what helped me a lot, again, doesn't mean that's going to be for everybody, but what helped me a lot was looking at lands of breathing, looking at mouth taping, looking at just simple, inexpensive things like that. Did you go with. down the route of the hard gum? <laughs> What's a hard the thallium gum? gum? Like the thallium gum <laughs> that's super hard that like you really have to chew it. Did you, did no, you fuck with that? No, okay. This <laughs> build is, up the jaw. <laughs> those, those masses are going to get some jaw steps going. Okay, fair yeah. enough. I, I did, I did not, have not heard that. No, I've, I'm going to get some of that later. Just do yeah. some jaw or some jaw exercise or something. Just get um, the jaw exercise shit was funny. I don't, I've never <laughs> messed with that. I've never messed with that. Do you remember that? that? Yeah, yeah, I've seen it before. Yeah. Yeah. Pat Project family, I hope you guys are enjoying this bite. Did you know that cocaine increases your dopamine levels by two and a half times above baseline? Okay. Why is this important? Why is this important, Nansima? <laughs> because, you know, a really cool thing that we learned from Andrew Huberman is that getting yourself into cold water or cold water exposure, like the cold plunge, does the same thing. What? Two and a half times above baseline, and you have those sustained dopamine levels for up to four or five hours after cold exposure. This is why we love cold plunging so much. I cannot say this enough. It has been one of the best additions to our daily routines. If you can already, just take cold showers, but if you want to take to the next level, get the cold plunge, and Andrew, how can they do it? You guys got to head over to thecoldplunge.com, and at checkout, enter promo code POWERPROJECT to save $150 off. I keep saying it, and I'm going to keep saying it till I'm blue in the face and not blue from the cold, blue from holding my breath. This has been the absolute <laughs> best thing I've ever done for my mental health. I just, I'll, I, like I said, I can't say it enough. So again, thecoldplunge.com, promo code POWERPROJECT. Uh, links to them down in the description as well as the podcast show notes. Let's get back to this podcast. No, um, the, the phallium gum, it's like the super hard gum that some people use that if they're trying to, let's say that they didn't do a lot of hard chewing when they were younger or mm. they do find that their jaw's small, they'll get this gum. It's called phallium gum on Amazon and it's really oh. hard and you chew it and you can... It made a difference for me. It took a long time, but I was like chewing that every fucking day incessantly. How interesting. Um, so it was pretty interesting. Yeah. But some people go down that route too. It's yeah. it's a deep rabbit hole. I mean, yeah, the whole at um, well, that will probably like be a um, a lot of um, his early work. My brother, um, he's changed a lot and like developed a lot more since then. Mm -hmm. But it was like a lot of the Western A price stuff. Whereas all like he would go yeah. to those and he'd say like oh, they ch they have these atypical diets, but um, all the more traditional ancestral diets. <laughs> Hashtag liver king. <laughs> let's, go, let's go chew on some fucking sticks or something. Um, <laughs> but, it, some bones. Um, but then it would then create, yeah, more chewing, better jaw development and whatever. It was fascinating. Yeah. Did fascinating you, stuff. did you like when you were going down that rabbit hole of uh, starting to focus on nasal breathing and for some people, this can be such a frustrating topic, especially if they've never heard it before and especially if they breathe through their mouth a lot because it does take time to change that. And it's very sure. annoying. It's very annoying. Mm. So for you, did you start doing that because you had an issue or you just started doing that because your brother told you this is super important. So you're like, let me just staple this yeah. for myself um, and make sure. I actually can't remember specifically. Um, mm. I think it, I have suffered a lot from allergies. Nothing mm -hmm. horrendous, but just annoying where like I also would snore a little bit as well. And my brother observed, he was like, hey, you're snoring. I remember when I, um, 
this is before I made my own, but I had I found nasal strips in the um in the bathroom. Yeah. And and I thought that he'd got them for me. But he was like, no, no, you got them. I was like, I don't remember that. I don't know. So I, I don't even know where it really started or why it started. But I do know that when I was younger, I, even now I suffer a lot from allergies. Mm -hmm. And I do I do suffer a lot from like mouth breathing versus nasal breathing. It's, it's a default thing sometimes, especially when I travel and teach so much. It's pretty much impossible to be nasal breathing when you're talking. You have to breathe through your mouth. Mm. So if you spend eight hour a day, 12 hour a day, even just three hour podcast, you know, and you're talking, that's a lot of mouth breathing. And that's a lot of the, the habit of your brain learning how to, position yourself to mouth breathe it more effectively. Yeah. It doesn't mean that we've got to stop talking, <laughs> of course, mm -hmm. but this may mean that we may be doing things such as when we're sleeping where we can reset things and sort mm -hmm. of bring your body back to that balance or whatever it may be. Um, but yeah, I, I can't remember specifically what it was that really triggered it for me, whether it was, because again, like he thinks that I started a nasal stripping. I, I, swear, I swear I got it from you, Damien. I don't know. <laughs> I can't yeah. remember. Um, but it was Big thing. I remember the first time I started like mouth taping and like using nasal strips at night. Um, I was like, holy fuck, the next morning you just like, rock hard. Bummer. Yes. I was like, this is, and yes. it, it, and then the more like I got into like thinking, um, like I'm trying to understand like nitric oxide or whatever, it was fascinating. Cause I mean, um, how many guys when they, again, you wouldn't know, natural, um, but how many guys on, on steroids <laughs> got super high testosterone and they can't get their dick hard? And how, how does it happen? It's like, and so, well, yeah, they should I take more testosterone. Is that going to give them a harder dick? Not necessarily. Because if anything, the more steroids you take, the harder it's going to be for you to get your dick rock hard because your blood gets thicker. And then that blood can't get down to some microcapillaries around your mm. dick. And you can't get a bone. And then you look at, like, what is Viagra? What is Cialis? These aren't testosterone pills to give you a harder dick. They're vasodilators. Like, ah, this kind of makes a fair bit of sense now as to how this all works. This is why, like, a lot of bodybuilders take, um, like, Cialis or Viagra pre-workout for the pumps, for the blood flow. It's like, oh, this is fascinating. It's, it's, it's a cool little, like, side side benefit to nasal breathing for the maybe the nitric oxide production. I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, because, yeah, like, I'm, yeah, it's, it's just, yeah, fascinating. Yeah. Do you uh, mess with it in training too? Cialis or nasal breathing? Or boners now. Boners. <laughs> now, do you mess with uh, nasal breathing while you're training? Do you? Yeah, yeah. Uh, between sets as much as I can. And when I'm warming up, I do as well. Like I even use it just as a um, like when I'm warming up, um, like doing some kind of basic cardio based warm up, I will try to nasal breathe through that because it creates more resistance to my airway, so my um, respiratory muscles have to work a bit harder mm -hmm. as I'm going under load. Helps to get them stronger and more robust, and um, helps to warm them up as well. So when I actually do my hard sets in the gym. I'm more ready to go to bring more oxygen in and transport nutrients around and push out the waste. Um, there was, uh, and there are still times now where I dabble a lot with um, uh, wearing nasal strip when I'm training. Hmm. Like just help mm -hmm. with that in my rest periods. But you don't even need to do that. Like all you do, so this is actually, this is from um, dentists and the TMJ specialist. It's called the Coddles Maneuver. If you just put your hand on your cheekbone and you pull it out to the side like that, you better breathe through your nose better. So you can just do that between sets. And that's mm. as if you were a nasal, a nasal strip. Cool. And for a lot of people that helps them realize, oh, this is what it feels like to actually breathe the nose properly is pulling my nasal passageways open to create less resistance there. Um, I also find um, nasal breathing, I use it a ton for teaching people about bracing. Because we know, again, breathing, bracing is so connected. But it's, there are going to be anomalies, but it's um, very, very, um, very hard to not contract your diaphragm more forcefully when you nasally breathe. You can breathe through your mouth and go, oh, take a big breath in and not create any change through your midsection and in terms of bracing and that whole core stability thing. But if you breathe through your nose, it almost automatically in most people creates that expansion that we want circumferentially. So I can try to teach somebody how to do the right bracing technique, the Vasov maneuver, the clamping down or whatever. Or I can just say, hey, breathe through your nose for the next mesocycle. Just make that your thing. Breathe through your nose to set up your brace before you squat and deadlift. And they'll just teach them how to do these things more effectively. And then long term, yeah, if you don't want to do it, don't do it. But it's a good cueing to help to rewire that brain to learn how to do what it's meant to do for, for bracing or for lifting. But also, yeah, for the recovery thing, because things are breathing more parasympathetic, helps to calm you down between sets. Um, so there's going to be tons of benefits to that as well. And Oh, go ahead. Real quick, uh, the feet aspect that we were talking about. Yeah. Um, did you notice any difference for yourself when you started, when you transferred to Vibrams? Did you do anything specifically to strengthen your feet or did you just focus on that and over time, did, what kind of change did you notice, if any? Yeah, so when I first started wearing Vibrams from going from like your regular sneakers or whatever, mm -hmm. the first thing I got was incredibly, incredible lower back pain. 
Oh, and I was like, really? this is fucked. Knee pain, elbow, um, not elbow pain, this would be fucking weird. <laughs> <laughs> Knee pain, hip pain, lower back pain. Because uh-huh. I just went all in. Like, yes. I'm an all in kind of guy, you know, the kratom straight back. Um, <laughs> How are you feeling, by the way, with that? I've got cotton mouth. Mm. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. That happens for sure. Yeah. <laughs> wow. The fuck is really in there? <laughs> <laughs> You're trying to get kicked out of the country or something. <laughs> I'm not going to be allowed back to Australia later. So we're going to do a drug. It's like, hey, what's this shit in your system? Do you need more liquid? No, I'm fine. I'm okay, fine. you go. Yeah, mm-hmm. it, it's a nice feeling. It's fun. To okay. cut I, feel, I like to feel something, you know. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like a true addict. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but yeah, the first thing I noticed was like, oh my God, my lower back, my whatever, all these things are in pain. Mm-hmm. And now a lot of people would have that and be like, this is so bad for me. But I was like, that's so cool. That's mm-hmm. so interesting. What's happening? Yeah. And um, who knows what's happening for sure anyway, but my thing was, oh, now my feet have to work so much harder and they can't mm-hmm. because they're so weak because of so long being in these foot coffins. So um, it just took time for them to get stronger because at the moment when I first did it, my feet weren't ready. I just didn't tolerate the volume well and yeah. the load management and other stuff that would compensate and they couldn't and it just felt weird for about a week and then eventually it caught up. Um, now, I would do a lot of foot strengthening stuff, different like just basic toe walking drills or uh, even just trying to create the short foot exercise because I've got very flat feet. It's trying to create an arch in my foot, yeah. that kind of stuff I was trying to work on and um, I found some benefit to it. My feet shape has changed over time. Mm. Like when I wear, um, like I've been wearing sneakers now, um, like regular, not vibrance for a little while for just being on the road because it's more fashionable. Um, but I know that when I go back to um, wearing Vibrans, it'll feel weird. Yeah. Um, but because I notice when I wear Vibrans for a while and I go back to sneakers, they feel so restrictive. Yeah. Because my feet, they get wider and smaller or whatever, that they change dipping on the footwear that you wear. And it's chronic. And honestly, how much of that is really a big issue? I'm really not sure. Mm. Like years ago, I was like, yeah, this is why we're fucked. Because you're jamming your foot into these sneakers. It's creating this this, um, what do they call that? The, um, with the toe points Bunion. inwards, bunions yeah. and, uh, whatever other issues. And the reality is how much of that is really going to be the answer. I don't know. I mean, if you look at some of the best athletes in the world, they've got some fucked up feet. <laughs> they got some fucked up, ugly looking feet. Um, I'm not good with athletes, but I know like, I'm pretty sure Usain Bolt, I'm pretty sure one of those basketball players got ugly, just weird yeah, misshapen LeBron. feet. And yeah, LeBron was it? Okay. Yeah. I was like, yeah, this is some ugly feet. Um, like I'm sure that they don't do any toe spreading. I'm sure they don't do any footwork and they can still perform and they're, they're probably, I don't know, but they're probably pain-free. They've got high performance levels. Yeah. So, and this is a huge thing is it's an, very, it's very sexy and it's very easy to sell to you say, ha, your footwear is what's killing your gains. Your footwear is what's causing your lower back pain. Your foot, your, your shoes are killing you and you got to buy this new shoe that I'm going to be releasing in a few weeks time or whatever. And I think it helps some people, but it also, it also isn't necessarily completely evidence-based, which is the issue yeah. that I have with it. And I so say like, yeah, I love foot strength. I think it's important. I also think it's a, there's a big, of, there's a big pendulum switch where, um, pendulum swing in that direction where it's taken to the extreme which is limiting to some people because people see, oh, that's the silver bullet. Mm. That's going to fix my issues. I've got to get these shoes now. And then it can create this psychological thing where, oh my God, I was wearing sneakers today. I'm going to be in pain now and I'm all fucked up now. I'm going to say, oh, I've got knee pain because I don't have these shoes. And it, it creates a whole complicated thing. Um, and that's why like, I saw some benefits, but I also went down the extreme of saying, when I was getting into the real foot stuff for a couple of years, I was so obsessive with it. It actually limited my progress. How so? Because I was so hyper focused on my feet all the time and like creating a strong root and externally rotating, creating that torque into their own, I was squatting or whatever. Mm-hmm. It started to limit my actual squat ability because I was focusing on the wrong thing. Mm-hmm. Like when you squat a heavy weight, what should, you be, what should you be thinking about? Should you be thinking about the tripod stance and things like that? Maybe to a degree. But if you focus on that too much, you're going to forget about fucking squatting. You're going to forget about mm-hmm. pushing hard through the ground. Ideally, the one thing you focus on, in my opinion, and again, you probably going to have a better qualified opinion on this, but when you're squatting a heavy weight or a challenging weight, you should be thinking about pushing hard through the ground, pushing like through that midfoot and just drive it up. You shouldn't be thinking about rotating outwards, spreading the floor, all these 10 bajillion different cues, but I would. And if I, if I deviated, I was like, oh, that was wrong. Don't do that. That's bad yeah. for me. You're going to burst in the flames and die. And that was where I saw a lot of regression hmm. overall because I was too hyper-focused on the one thing. And that, in my opinion, is a big danger on a lot of these sexy things that come out in the industry. Hmm. Is helps a lot of people, absolutely helps a lot of people. So it's not discounting that. Um, but there are 
many people as well who become hyper-focused on that as the silver bullet because of their lack of knowledge or maybe even just their personality. Yeah. And they go, they dive headfirst into that. And then it takes away from what the real thing you're meant to be doing is just moving, training, progressively overloading. You become too technically focused. Um, and that was, that was my personal thing. Again, it doesn't apply to everybody, but that's why like, I'm also like, I'm mindful of how I communicate things to people saying this mm. is going to be beneficial on because it's not going to help everybody. And it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to have a negative impact on a lot of people as well. When a lot of people are probably fine to have flat feet, um, it's just another posture. It's like, I've still got flat feet now. It doesn't affect me at all. It didn't affect me back then either. Psychologically, it did though, mm. because I was told, oh, that's bad. Having you having flat feet is a dangerous thing. It's going to cause these issues. I was like, is it? Okay, I trust you. And then I took it too far. Yeah. You know, it's, I think the, the feet and breathing are, are kind of two similar things in my mind because the transition takes a long time for a lot yes. of people. If you've been an athlete who, when you're running or when you're doing cardiovascular work, <laughs> that's the thing you do. Mm. Trying to switch the way you breathe over time, it's just frustrating. It's like, why the fuck am I going to do this? I'm already performing fine, breathing through my mouth, doing these things. Yeah. There's really no reason to take the time to do it. it the the thing I the thing I guess is is kind of fucked with it is because it's not super evidence based right mm. and obviously anecdotal n of one when I started making the change from like focusing on nasal breathing during high cardiovascular exercise for me primarily jujitsu mm. my it took me a while but then after about maybe eight months my gas tank went from here to here. It's yeah. like super chill during while doing sparring, right? Mm. Um, I don't get gassed. Mm. And I notice that when my opponents are, <sighs> I'm like, and I'm still breathing through my nose, I'm still chill, I got them. Yeah. But it took a while to transition. And it's Absolutely. trying to convince somebody that your breathing or your nasal breathing, if you shift to that while you're doing something like jujitsu or cardio, you won't feel the benefits right now, but in the long term, you will. It's the same thing I noticed with the feet. Like mm. initially, I wasn't noticing much, and initially, I was making somewhat of a regression. But over time, it's like I walk differently. My yeah. feet are more active when I'm like not yeah. like usually. And and I had flat feet too. I actually had mm. surgery on my foot for soccer when I was younger. Oh, wow. But um, like initially, like my feet weren't really doing much when I'm just standing around or mm. when I'm doing jujitsu. It's like my toes weren't doing much. But now there's so much more awareness into what's happening there. The tendons are thicker, mm. but it takes a while. Yes. And again, it's not, there's no evidence behind it. But for me, it's very, it's very interesting how much of a difference it's made for my performance. Yeah. And I'm someone who already does a lot of athletics that I'm just like, if individuals can just take a step into, you know, doing things more barefoot more often or using their feet in different ways, gen pop, I, no research, but I really think it could make a massive difference for how they move, how they feel, et cetera. Mm. So it, it, it's, it's a topic that like, I don't think it's sexy because it takes a long time. Yeah. Like for some people, they'll be like, yeah, we, we, we fuck with vivos. Right. Mm. But mm it's not just transitioning into some barefoot shoes that's gonna be your thing. It's doing more things barefoot or, or yeah. with that. And it's painful for many. It was Absolutely. painful for me in the beginning. But if you can work your way through that transition period, it could pay very big dividends in the long run. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. I agree for sure. Like it's, it's for a lot of people it can be very beneficial. Yeah. Um, and it just comes down to, yeah, how we communicate that and how we let them know like the, the broad spectrum of it and also, um, like one thing, I guess, with the nasal breathing um, is like, I found it helpful as well for like jujitsu, like it helps you calm down. And there is actually some evidence where like the more you nasally breathe, like it does, it's used a lot by um, deep sea divers, mm -hmm. like the free divers for apnea training to help improve their CO2 tolerance. So there's a lot of actual like physiological mechanisms and reasons why it should be beneficial. Um, people then take that to mean, okay, I should always be nasal breathing. Mm. And then we've got to say, well, hang on. If you're sparring in jiu-jitsu, you're doing a bit of drilling, even if it's hard drilling, yeah, probably just try to nasal breathe as much as you can. But if you're in a comp, you're going to fucking mouth breathe. At if you're pushing point, maximally, yeah. you got to fucking mouth breathe. But again, this is where a little bit of information can be a dangerous thing. Because people are like, oh, nasal breathing is the, is the answer. And then they start tanking their performance because they won't let themselves ever mouth breathe. Mm. They'll say, oh, even though I'm pushing half, I've got to only nasally breathe. And then they're going to be so weak. They're going to get to a point um, where their body physiologically can't perform because they're yeah. forcing themselves to shut down the instinct of having to mouth breathe eventually because you, you need to. If you're pushing maximally close to your, th your max threshold, you must mouth breathe. Yeah. Even though like it's bad, it's like, well, it's... It's about the context of it. It's not, yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's not bad. There will come a point where you have to toggle it. But yeah. what I've noticed is like, 
you know, even enrolling or, or inspiring with high level individuals, I can, I can stay calmer while nasal breathing. And when the yeah. pace picks up, by the time they're already doing that, by the time I have to open my mouth, uh, yeah. like it's, it's like, ahead. I'm already ahead. Yeah. So now I'm like, but I'm still more relaxed than yes. my opponent who's now gassed themselves out because once they started getting fatigue, their immediate thing was to go from, <laughs> to, <laughs> you know what I mean? So like, yeah, yeah it, it's, it's, it's a problem because what, what we're talking about here is people that have the all or nothing mindset when it comes to applying something. Yeah. So I want to fix my feet. I'm going barefoot all the time. I'm fucking running barefoot. It's like, ah, <laughs> like, yeah. let, let's, it, it, the thing is, it's not sexy because it's sure. not fast. Yeah. The change that's going to happen is going to take you months, yeah. if not maybe a few years, if you've been mouth breathing for your whole life. Mm. There you is know? some good information too on like that zone two cardio. Yeah. The absolutely. mathetone method that's been around. That guy's been talking about it from the yeah. Since like the seventies, yeah. yeah. But no one really ever listened to him till more recently. But that is kind of uh, he didn't research nasal breathing, but mm. it was more like, uh, can you have a conversation yes. while you're doing exercise? And I think that that just is a really interesting thing. Like I, I kind of I've never really you know done this for excessive periods of time, so I don't know how effective it would be. But mm. if almost all of your training kind of was in in that uh, domain of being able to have kind of a conversation because we were talking about, you know, easing way back on your lifting, you yes. know, and so yes. maybe it could be applied to lifting and maybe it would have a tremendous benefit or maybe it's just like a little, maybe it's a little too extreme. Well, honestly, just like anything, it's all about how far we take it. Right. Like the zone two cardio, it's so incredibly beneficial. Like let's say the goal was to improve your conditioning and your cardiovascular health and your cardiovascular performance, aerobic performance. Zone two cardio is going to make up a humongous part of that because you know the, the physiological benefits of that. But if you only did that, then you, you're missing out all the other anaerobic and the aerobic power benefits, the max threshold stuff. So we've got to say, okay, it's very beneficial. How can I sprinkle it in? How do I periodize that in the plan? That's all it is. And it's, it's just like all the mobility stuff from before. It's about where's the gap? How do we fill that gap? How much do you really need? And then how much can you afford to throw in before it starts taking away from other things that we're doing in terms of like max power output or force output or whatever it is. Um, yeah, and that's where like nasal breathing, I think it's incredible because it helps relax you. And zone two cardio, incredible. If we go too extreme on it, which you know, I've done, it's at the cost of your max power or your max exertion or your performance. And then if we're really trying to drive adaptation in like jujitsu or in bodybuilding or powerlifting, you need those max effort pushes where you're mouth breathing sometimes as well. Mm -hmm. um, and if we don't train that because we're obsessed about the zone two or we're obsessed about the nasal breathing, it's it becomes very, um, not, I shouldn't say dangerous, but it, becomes, it has a negative impact despite you doing the right thing. And that's where a lot of people live. Unfortunately, they're doing what's right, but they haven't. They don't have. They don't have the complete picture around how to fit it into a plan intelligently, um, or how to appropriate that for their context. And then they get, they go too far in one extreme and they start regressing. And even if it's not for performance, just for general gen pop people, you don't want them to regress. You want them to be able to always be coming back in the gym or exercising in some way and getting some meaningful change out of that for live a healthy life, like beyond our extreme goals, because we are kind of an anomaly as as lifters. People don't people forget that. It's like we're an anomaly, and most people who actually need this kind of stuff, they're getting too confused by all these extremes and by our niche. Mm. Yeah. For you nowadays, what does your training like look like with your goals? Because you 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 do calisthenics. I mm. saw you posted something about improving connective tissue mm. um, with certain calisthenic type movements. So what does what are your goals for yourself, um, and how do you structure all of that? Since you you've done so many things with training, yeah, yeah, it's it's a mess, it's a <laughs> fucking mess. And this is honestly one of the one of the hardest things. The biggest challenge for me with training is there are so many things I want to do, and there's not like I'm not a bodybuilder, I'm not a powerlifter. Like I'm not a jiu-jitsu guy. I do all these things. I, I I like to surf. I want to swim. I want to go deep sea diving. I want to I want to sing. I want to play guitars. Like fuck, how do I bounce all this shit out? Yeah. Um. So, as best as I can, I try to focus as much as I can on one thing and say, mm -hmm. okay, next block is going to be muscle building, um, for the next twelve weeks. Twelve weeks. I'm going to do like power lifting stuff. And so let's say I'm doing a, a muscle building program, which is what I was doing before I because I went on tour, because now on tour, I haven't been training much at all. Um, but before I was on tour, and when I come back home, it'll be pure like biasing towards muscle building. Mm -hmm. So I'll just do a typical, maybe push-pull leg or some kind of higher frequency, like upper lower or full body kind of program. Um, and then I'll still try to sprinkle in a little bit of maintenance levels of conditioning work, maintenance levels of 
um, calisthenics to be able to maintain that joint mobility and integrity. Mm -hmm. uh, like a lot of the wrist strengthening stuff for handstands, it's it's quite arduous. Um, <laughs> yeah. But um, and I can't I can't excel at that if I'm doing bodybuilding stuff or muscle building stuff. But I'll, I'll come back to that again later on. Um, so it's my training is very dynamic because it, it changes. Like I'm using I'm doing everything, and again that's my challenge is. I've got to make sure I give myself a set window saying the next six to 12 weeks is going to be muscle building. So you're going to do this program and yes, you want to get better at handstands or yes, you want to get better at jujitsu, but you can't focus on that right now. They're going to be on maintenance mode and you're going to do yeah. muscle building now and it's coming. Delay that gratification. Don't try to do it all, all at once. Mm -hmm. I've tried and you burst into flames and it's, it's, it's not good. <laughs> it's not good. No one likes that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Calories in, calories out. Where do you stand on some of this? Oh, fuck. <laughs> this is going to be fun. Well, it, you know, like we've talked a lot about training and training. Uh, we actually kind of think on this podcast that uh, training still isn't like talked about enough. And your performance in the gym is a huge factor. And it is where a lot of people struggle. But a lot of people really struggle with the food side of things. So yeah, where do you kind of stand on um, this? Look, you, you can't refute this idea of calories in, calories out. Okay, you need to, if you want to, lose fat or if you want to build muscle, whatever it is, we need to be playing with this, um, the laws of thermodynamics. You, you need to adhere to the fact that if you want to lose weight or if you want to lose fat, you need to in some meaningful way be in this calorie deficit. But not to refute what I just said, <laughs> even though but usually comes up with that, I think we hyper-focus on that. We oversimplify things and there's a lot of confusion around that. Okay. Um, and this is where we kind of miss the forest for the trees um, because we're focusing on this minutia. Now, how do I best put this? Um, because it's a very complicated thing, in my opinion. But it can also be simplified in a way that helps to communicate the message appropriately. So here's an example. How many calories do you eat right now, roughly? I got no idea. And Seema, <laughs> please tell me something. <laughs> <For me? laughs> you got to work with me here. got to work with me. You know, it, it, it's interesting because, I mean, I used to track a lot when I was doing yeah. bodybuilding. Yeah. But nowadays, there will be certain days where I know I'm in a deficit. And there will be certain days when I can feel in the morning, oof, I need to eat more food, that I'm in a surplus. So probably anywhere between some days, 22 to 2,400 calories. And then other days, 3,000 to 3,500 if it's if I've been in a deficit for quite a few days. All right, all so right. it's, it's dynamic, yeah, it's dynamic, but I don't yeah. track anymore. Sure. I just have a mental understanding yeah. of it. Yeah, and that's that's fine. Um, so let's say like on average, let's say um, eating around 3,000-ish calories for sure. Let's say we wanted to get you like dick skin lean shredded, which I mean, mm -hmm. you already are, so it's fuck. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's say we want to get you like, yeah, like completely disgustingly shredded where I want to see like, Everyone wants to see your heart beating yeah. through through your through your chest there somehow magically. Um, <laughs> we would say, okay, we've got to start putting you in a calorie deficit consistently. Mm -hmm. So you might say you're eating three thousand on average now. Let's bring you down to twenty nine hundred. Let's bring you down to twenty eight hundred. Let's just gradually decrease things, right? Um, and I must say the same for you as well, Mark. We say, yeah, you're eating say three thousand. Let's just gradually just bring things down. This is us adhering to the calories in, calories out, which we know works. Um, and if took an extreme approach and I said to you, well, instead, why don't we put you on to 1,000 calories? Mm. Why don't I put you on to 1,500? You know, why don't I do that on average? You did that recently. I did that recently. <laughs> and this is, where, this is where we're sort of going with it because if we do that, people are going to be like, that's bad. You're going to shut down your metabolism. You're going to fuck yourself up. You're going to die. You're going to lose all your muscle. You're going to ruin your hormones. You're going to completely derail yourself. And it doesn't happen. It can happen. And it does happen in some people. But... Taking that fear and saying, we should never put you on 1,400 calories, we should never put you on 1,000 calories, that's focusing too much on calories mm. and not what actually matters, which is slightly different, which is energy. Okay, If I have you eating in a calorie deficit, if I have you eating 1,000 calories a day, on paper, you are in a calorie deficit, but your body your actual physical physiology is not in a deficit. We've created an energy deficit, but your body will make up for it in some way. Your body will get that extra 2,000 calories that it needs to maintain itself from body fat, which would be great, um, and maybe from muscle mass, probably less likely, depending how we're setting things up. Mm -hmm. um, but the other thing you can do, because it can also create metabolic adaptations, and we get this slowdown in your, in your BMR. In some way there, that's, what, that's what's going to happen. Yeah. But for all intents and purposes, if you have sufficient fuel, sufficient energy available on your body, there's no reason why I can't slash away 2,000 calories from your diet overnight and your body sh can't just go to that energy on your system and use that. Mm -hmm. Now, there is a caveat to that. 
I would not do that to you. Definitely not, because there is a rate at which your body can pull energy from its system in terms of like the amount of, and that is dependent on the amount of fat that you have on your body. And there may be some physiological things like your mitochondrial density, how much mitochondria you have, because that's how that's where your body is going to be burning up fat to use as a fuel as a as a fuel source. Um, so I think people freak out and they think we well, would take this slow methodical approach, and it actually doesn't always play out that way. Like, what are the drawbacks to a slow methodical approach? If I put you on twenty nine hundred calories instead of three thousand, that's fucking hard to track. So, yeah. Almost if you are a robot, it's very very hard to track. How easy is it for you to adhere to a deficit if I take away two thousand fucking calories? Even if you fuck that up, you're still going to be in a deficit. Yeah. So what we're really playing with here is um, making sure that your body is in enough of a deficit where it's easy for you to track it. But it's also um, meeting the points where it's not going to create too much adaptation, mm -hmm. which is going to be dependent on how quickly can you physically lose body fat. My belief and my, my opinions and my, my workings around this is I believe we should always be trying to, if we're trying to lose fat, I'm um, taking that as a context. We should be trying to diet as hard as we physically can. Get as much fat as you can, do it as aggressively as possible, as quickly as possible. Mm. Okay. And I want to I want to rip away as much as I can. And that's going to be different for different people. Mm -hmm. And this is where we come back to my example for myself personally. When I started um dieting in December, I I, I went from about twenty five to three twenty five hundred to three thousand calories down to a thousand overnight. Now, was it perfectly a thousand? Probably wasn't. I was probably inaccurately tracking a few things, mm -hmm. but there was definitely a significant drop by at least a thousand, if not maybe two thousand ish calories on average um, every single day. Mm -hmm. And that got me very lean to begin with, but then of course it stalled out. How long was the diet? That was, that was the first instant, the first iteration of it was four weeks. I okay. did that. And I dropped maybe, um, it was about four or five kilos. So what's that? About maybe. 10 to 15 ish pounds. Yeah. And I got significantly leaner from doing that. Um, people would say, okay, now you've plateaued out. You've got to go lower than that. It's like, no, you don't. I've gotten leaner now, which means I've got less available fuel on my body, which means my body can't take as much energy from my body as readily. It won't do that. So what I need to do now is I need to eat more food. I've got to still be in a deficit to be able to lose fat, but I can still eat more food by doing that to make up for the loss of available energy on my body because there is still that rate mm -hmm. of fat loss that your body can achieve at a particular time. So the first five kilos or so that I dropped, I was eating a thousand calories. The next five kilos that I dropped, I was eating between 1500 to 2000 calories. But the, the next five kilos take a little bit longer to drop? It took a little bit longer. And that's it. Like as you get leaner, mm -hmm. you, because you have less available fuel in your body, you can't diet as hard. Yeah. But for most people who have got a lot more body fat, Diet fucking hard. Like take those, ca as long as it's within your preference, of course, but just why would you drag it out? Yeah. Why would you drag out something over 16 weeks when it could take you four weeks instead? Yes, it's a bit tougher, but you know what? Like it's going to be tough anyway. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be easier for you to manage to go into a more aggressive diet and then just, again, monitor your feedback and understand what are you really doing? I'm not doing a crash diet on a thousand calories for the sake of it. I'm doing it because I've got available fuel. When I have less available fuel in my body, I can't diet as hard, so I won't diet as hard. So by the end of it, yeah, I was only in maybe a hundred calorie deficit by the very end of my diet when I got really lean. I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm only really eating a hundred calories, maybe 200 calories below my needs. And that's harder to track, but it's um, only at the very end. At the very start, like assuming my body can pull the body fat off its system very easily, I don't feel a thing. Like I didn't suffer. I didn't suffer from eating so few calories. Um, and it kind of flies in the face of what is done traditionally. Yeah. That's not why I do it. I do it from a physiological perspective of saying, yeah, I've got available fat. Let's do that. Now, what do most people do? The flip side of that is very, very, very different. People will, will diet very, very slow and they'll continually decrease their calories over time. Mm -hmm. So at the point when they're at their leanest, they're eating the fewest calories, which makes perfect sense. Okay, we, we eventually you need, need to be, if you're like completely bodybuilder shredded, you need to be eating very few calories. But there's a big mismatch when they're at their leanest and they have the fewest amount of available energy on their body, mm -hmm. they're eating the fewest calories. So of course you're gonna feel like shit. Of course your gym performance is gonna go down. Of course you're going to potentially create more of these negative adaptations. Like one study that people bring up a lot when I talk about these aggressive diets is The Biggest Loser. There's a, mm -hmm. a, a study done a, a few years ago on The Biggest Loser contestants where they were, um, showing that many years after they've lost all that weight, their basal metabolic rate had stayed down. Like 
that tells you why you shouldn't do crash diets. And it's like, mm. no, it does, it does not, that's not what it's saying. It's saying that this is what's happened to those people. We need to unpack why has that happened. And I don't know for sure, but one of my takes on it is like, yeah, they dieted too hard, but they also did a fuckload of training. And there was a big imbalance. They were throwing a lot of stressful insults on their system. And there's a big mismatch there where they're trying to um, push their body. And then what we know in terms of adaptation now is, yeah, that's going to happen more aggressively. You're going to get more adaptations happening to your body more aggressively if you're mismatching your training and your performance in your everyday lifestyle with your nutrition intake. Mm -hmm. But this is what we're doing with people's diets all the time is we progressively adapt people down to the point where they are very lean, they're eating very few calories, and they're doing a fuckload of training. Of course, that's going to be unsustainable. And of course, it's going to create these issues where they're going to get these adaptations. If they took a more methodical approach and said, okay, when you're at your leanest, you have the least amount of available energy on your body. You need to support that by putting more food in. Mm. And as long as you are in a calorie deficit still at the end of the day, you will still get leaner. It will be much slower. It'll be much trickier. It will be much complex, m much more complex. <laughs> Good English, Eugene. Um, <laughs> so, but that's probably a smarter approach. So when I was at my leanest around March or so, um, March or April or whatever it was, I was eating the highest amount of calories. My rate of fat loss was slow. I had to be so, so meticulous with things. But by that point, hey, I'm already fucking shredded. I'm already lean. Do I really need to go a bit further? I don't. I can maintain this now. Yeah. And that's a big deal. Um, whereas at the start when I've got a lot of fat to lose, just push it hard. Mm -hmm. Push it hard because you've got the available fuel there. Um, so it's not breaking any laws. It's just being more mindful about what are we really manipulating here. We're manipulating not calories. We're manipulating energy, energy availability. Your body's got to get energy from somewhere. And if it can't, it will create adaptations. So whenever we take away our energy um, in terms of the, the um, energy on our body or energy from our, from our food, we've got to make sure we're balancing that out in some way. Otherwise, your body will balance it out by decreasing hormone production, mm -hmm. by decreasing immune system function, by decreasing all its regenerative recovery properties. And that's what we want to avoid. Um, the other side to this is people say, if you eat a thousand calories and go back up to maintenance, you're going to be fucked. You're going to put on the weight back on. I was like, well, it's not true. Like there's a difference that people forget between the deficit, there's a calorie surplus, and then there's a maintenance. Yes. And maintenance may mean an extra thousand calories, depending how far you push things. But that 1,000 calories, if it is true maintenance, you shouldn't put on any weight, mm -hmm. apart from maybe glycogen fluid fluctuations, but there shouldn't be significant fat gain from that. And that's what I would do. So in between my, my aggressive dieting periods of four weeks or three to four weeks at a time, I would have a couple of weeks where I'd eat at maintenance. Yeah. And I wouldn't put on any body fat from that, despite eating an extra 1,500 calories, because I'd go from eating 1,000 up to 2,500, I wouldn't put on any body fat. Mm -hmm. I'd feel great, perform, I'd be, I could handle more volume in the gym, cool. And then I'll just drive it back down again. Yeah. So first off, what you're saying makes a lot of sense. Mm. Now, it's the application aspect that yeah. people need to, like, I want to use an example. There's this guy in our Discord. His name is Bruce. He's, he's a bit overweight, um, but he's choosing to do one meal a day. And then he, he's around four something. But for him currently, that is extremely sustainable. He's saying, wow, like I can actually eat as much as I want real food in this one meal. Yeah. Um, I'm dropping weight. I don't feel hungry because he's, he's adapted to that. And it, it's, it's working for him right now because he has a lot of body fat on his frame. Yeah. Right. Over time, it's going to adjust. He'll probably end up eating a little bit more food as he gets leaner, but it's going to be a while until that happens. Mm. Now, one thing with what you're talking about, I agree with it, mm. but all of these other things you're probably doing to allow that thousand calories to actually work for you. It's like, you're probably getting great sleep. Mm. You probably, I'm assuming that within that thousand calories, it's all real food mm. because if you had a lot of foods that weren't satiating, then I don't, I'm actually curious of how you felt doing that over that period of time. Were you struggling because you were feeling hungry or what tactics were you using to stave off hunger? Because that is, can work and that does mm. work. It's just people need to have the right tactics around the food, their food choices mm. um, and what they're doing so that they don't feel the need to binge. Because yep. the thing is, is like that, if you know what you're doing, that's gonna work. Yeah. But if you don't have things set up, you're gonna, you're gonna binge. You're not gonna think the diet's working for a bit because you're feeling hungry all the time. Um, so you just need a, uh, what are you doing on the outside of the mm. diet so that you're able to sustain it? Yeah, for sure. That's a really big, a really big question, a really good question because 
Um, the same things can apply to people doing a less aggressive diet as well. Okay, you get someone doing a sustainable 10% drop in their calories and decrease that over time, you've got to have the same conversations yeah. around um, yeah, energy intake and potentially getting hunger and binging and all those kinds of things. So, and making sure your sleep is optimal and make sure your recovery and your training is managed well and your nutrient status as well. So for me personally, when I was dieting, those things to me were pretty optimal in inverted commas that they were in a, in a good place. So mm -hmm. I didn't feel a thing. Mm -hmm. I slashed away those calories and there was no physiological reason why I should feel hungry. Maybe an emotional thing. Absolutely. And that does play into a lot of people. For me personally, the reason why it fits well is because I don't have a lot of emotional attachment around that. Mm. Now, that's not a good fit for a lot of people. Okay, so that's why I would not apply to some Explain people. that a little bit real quick, though. Well, I, I'm completely fine with just not eating certain foods and say, okay, I can't eat pizza anymore. Cool. Big deal. Mm -hmm. Take away mm -hmm. that from some people, it's a big emotional thing. Mm -hmm. They're like, I can't not have my nightly ice cream or whatever. For me, it's like, yeah, cool, whatever. You know, And that's probably from a, a lot of years of overdoing things in the bodybuilding world. Well, I was just focused on obsessively like food is fuel, yeah. that kind of thing. So that's not going to apply to a lot of people, of course. And that's fair enough. Um, but yeah, for me, I don't have those attachments to food. I, obviously, I love, I'm a big foodie. Like we love going out to eat and like enjoying and trying new things all the time. It's mm -hmm. a big experience beyond that. Um, so I do love food. I'm not like some rigid robot. like mm, food is fuel all the time. <laughs> um, but yeah, for me, like I, I'm okay with doing that. Mm -hmm. Um but you know what, I, I would I would tell anybody if they're going to start a diet, make sure you're in that mental state. Okay, like even, I don't care if you're doing it hard or if you're doing it slow. You are going to fucking fail if you don't have your head screwed on right mm -hmm. from a from an emotional standpoint. Okay, and that's, I, I don't care if you're 100 kilos overweight or 10 kilos overweight or just like trying to get a little bit leaner for summer or whatever. The exact same things apply to make it sustainable. You've got to make sure that your head's screwed on right and you're doing whatever necessary work it may be, whether it's a therapy thing for a lot of emotional eaters, to come to terms with that. And it can just be a lot of just work outside of the constructs of just pure calories and nutrition and training or whatever. Um, because otherwise, no matter how slow, how quickly you do things, you're still gonna fail because you haven't really addressed the big triggers there. Mm. And the same thing with like say nutrient status. So of course, eating a thousand calories a day, it is pretty much impossible to get all the nutrients that your body needs yeah. from a vitamin RDI perspective. So that's where I would make sure I was eating, having multivitamin. And that's where eating a thousand calories a day is definitely not sustainable. Mm -hmm. and that's why I said, okay, I'm gonna do this for at most four weeks. I'm gonna pull myself, I'm gonna see the fat loss I need to see, and I'm gonna come back out of it and manipulate those things. So I have a methodical plan. Um, and But for all intents and purposes, there's no reason why you should feel shit and there's no reason why you should feel hungry. Let's take the emotional side out of it. Where does the hunger really come from? Okay, it's because your body has decided that you're lacking energy. But if you've got all this energy on there, on your body as body fat, it shouldn't be lacking energy. Maybe it's lacking its ability to access it because you're doing things too hard mm -hmm. or because you're training way too much and too hard and your body can't access it quickly enough. So of course you're gonna feel like shit and feel hungry. So what I would do when I decrease my calories so much, I said, okay, I can't train as hard. So I halved my volume. I well, probably more than half. Like I was doing maybe 20, 30 sets per body part per week. I went down to maybe between five to 10 sets per body part per week, which is more than enough to maintain muscle mass. Yeah. And in some contexts, it may even help you build muscle mass eating, doing, doing so little. I changed my rep schemes up so it was less endurance high reps, more lower strength, like pure triples, four, um, four rep, maybe five reps at most. Great for maintenance of muscle mass, great for maybe building some strength as well. Not very taxing from a recovery perspective. Mm -hmm. So there's no reason why my body can't access enough fuel to be able to fuel that training. Um, and then outside of that, like I was, there's no reason for me to be hungry. There's no reason for me to feel like shit because I've got enough energy on my body. If I went down to 500 calories or I went down to zero calories, I'm probably going to have issues. Yeah. Because there is, again, that rate at which your body can do things at. But again, there are, if I was extremely obese, not saying we should, but you, in theory, could go to zero calories and just fast because you've got all this body fat on your body. But we're playing a bit of a thing here where, like, if you could go completely zero calories, then maybe you can't feel any training. Because mm -hmm. you do need some glucose, because you need some glycogen coming in, or some glycogen available to be able to fuel heart training. Um, so we're going to play a bit of a push and pull there. Um, but yeah, if we look at look at it and say, where does the hunger come from? What's what's the message that your body's receiving and sending out to give you hunger and cravings? Apart from the emotional side, which is a whole nother 
conversation that I'm not qualified to really give much advice on. Mm. But the hunger itself is coming because your body can't get enough energy. So why is that? Is it because your training is mismatched? Is it because your diet is too aggressive? And it could be either one of those things. Yeah. Um, so for me personally, I made sure that I didn't diet too aggressively. I dieted as aggressively as I feasibly could, mm -hmm. given my current context, which is why over time, the calories went higher as I dieted. And I made sure that I managed training appropriately. So I wasn't doing as much jujitsu. I wasn't doing as much endurance-based stuff. Yeah. I was doing enough to maintain muscle mass, maintain strength, and just let the diet do its work. And were you doing cardio at that time? No. No, no. Okay. Not that cardio is bad, but there is probably a higher probability um, that I may start wasting tissue, muscle tissue, if I start doing a lot more okay. cardio. So You're I did a little bit walking. for maintenance. Yeah, I, I did still stay active, yeah. but I didn't try to arbitrarily increase my steps mm. or add in more cardio. I said, no, you know what? I'm eating a thousand calories. That's below my BMR. Yeah. Okay, me just being in a coma, if I did nothing, I'm still going to drop weight by having that. Mm. And that's, so there's no need to do extra conditioning or start on top of that. Mm. So as long as I can just maintain whatever I'm doing, my body's still going to lose fat. Now I would do some because I like doing it for sure. Um, but yeah, that's the mistake people make is they take away calories and they do more work, which sounds correct. And it is in theory kind of correct of calories in, calories out. But it does create a lot of issues when it's mismatched and it's too far, too much exercise, not enough food to fuel that. Ideally, it should be eat more and move more or eat less and do less. Mm -hmm. That's how you match them up. And then assuming that it's in the paradigm of a surplus or a deficit, you will lose fat or you will build muscle. Mm. I'm, I'm really digging this different approach than I've ever heard because you're right, starting period, just it kind of sucks. Yeah. And then when you think about it, like shit in, in you know eight weeks, 12 weeks, whatever, it's going to be the hardest. Like that's what I have to look forward to. It's <laughs> almost like a Band-Aid, right? Let's just get the shitty low calorie side out of it and then build from there. But um, what I want some clarification on is like that thousand calories that was for a short period and how long was the whole diet and what was this for? Because I'm just thinking mm. of like the, you know, it's Father's Day. So like the dad, like, oh, I just want to, you know, get in a little bit better shape. And it's like, yeah. oh wait, thousand calories, that's what I'm doing. But it's like, what was the goal and how long was yeah. the whole diet? Um, the goal was just for funsies. You know, I want okay. to get leaner. <laughs> <laughs> You're also in this space though. Yeah, so, yeah. I just wanted to get leaner. Um, and like, that's how I approach dieting in general. Like I was mm -hmm. like, oh, I'm getting a bit extra body fat. I need to get the body fat off. What's the most logical way for me to go about doing that? And that was that was it. What was the other part of the question? Uh, just how long was the, oh, the yeah, diet for? Oh, yeah, the length. So um, all up, it was about 12-ish weeks. Okay. But it wasn't 12 weeks straight. It was three to four week push, and then it was a couple of weeks off. Three to four week push, a couple of weeks off. And each one of those pushes wasn't to 1,000 calories. Mm -hmm. The first one was to 1,000 calories. The next one was to about 1,400. The final one was around 18 to 2,200 as I got leaner and leaner and leaner. So there'll, there'll be some, uh, I've got to find some photos on my Instagram of you can see the progressions I made there through those time periods. Um, and it was, yeah, I just, I got leaner and then I um, just increased calories as I got leaner. And it became a lot trickier. So that was, is that was, that was the first so four, so was the four, first weeks four weeks at 1200 calories. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, there's going to be fluid fluctuations there, of course. It's not all body fat that came off there, but there is a considerable amount of body fat that came off. That was the first four weeks that freaked everybody out. <laughs> and I'm like, well, like it's, it's an extreme response, but and that would normally take you, yeah, probably about 8, 10, 12 weeks to achieve normally. Why drag it out if you don't have to? Some people want to, and that's fine. Some people, preference-wise, they want to take longer, completely fine, do it slower. Um, but many people are like, why not just push it? Why not? If your body physiologically can do it, mm -hmm. if you set things up right with your training, your nutrition, your, your recovery is on point, just fucking send it. You know, you have body fat on your body, just push it. Why, why drag it out when you don't need to? And then but obviously by the end when I was very, very lean, I was eating a lot more food, the fat loss was slower. Yeah. Like you can't avoid that. You know, I'm not trying to reinvent the wheel here and say I've got the I've got the one secret to get you mm -hmm. shredded for life and eat more calories and get shredded for life. It's not what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. We're applying the same things here. Like, oh, hey, I'm still dieting for 12, 16 weeks all up eventually. Yeah. But I'm doing it in a way that's more sustainable, in my opinion. Also, guys, remember, uh, Eugene, how much did you weigh when you started that diet? Uh, 76 kilos. 76 kilos. Yeah, and, I'm, and I'm at my leanest point, I got to about 66. So okay. about 10 kilos. Because I know some people- 25 pounds. Yeah, some people are hearing the thousand calories and they're like maybe 200 pounds yeah. or 220 and they're yeah. like, I'm gonna go a thousand calories. Yeah. Just remember like that thousand calories for Eugene may be 1600 or 1800 for you Absolutely. because of your metabolic rate. So Absolutely. realize that. But <clears throat> uh, 
I really want to try to understand too, again, um, you know, you probably had your sleep on point. Uh, I'm curious about like how you handled the type of food you ate. Uh, mm. And I'm also curious about like, like what are tactics for people to be, what tactics can people use mm. to be able to um, make sure that they're still they're staving off hunger yeah. or they're, they're not, you know, because for me, um, you know, fasting is very in fashion for some people, mm. but that was a practice that helped me not to be food focused. Cause in the past I was very food focused. Right. I had a large eating frequency and I ate a lot. And when I diet dieting tended to be like, I, I did a 40 week diet for a show mm. and I had high eating frequency, but it was tough because I was very food focused. Now I can diet easily because I can eat one meal on certain days and feel fine. I don't yeah. eat as my frequency isn't as much. So I'm curious for you, um, what are tactics that people can use so that they can not be as food focused when going to such a large, large caloric deficit? Yeah. And like, I'll, again, I would say like, what are the tactics we should use when we're dieting in general, whether mm -hmm. it's large or small? Because yeah. the same thing is going to apply to everybody. Absolutely. Um, this is something that um, a buddy of mine, Luke Lehman, would call prepping to prep, where um, before you start a dieting phase, before you start a fat loss phase, or at least at the same time as you start a dieting phase, mm -hmm. make sure you're doing whatever you can to make sure you're setting yourself up physiologically for the to get the success out of this. Yeah. Okay. Um, and that will be things and that will also, that will qualify some people and that will disqualify some people. So I think a big thing to talk about as well is like, who is this approach and who is honestly dieting in general to an aggressive point or to a very lean point? Who is it probably not most applicable for? And it's going to be people who physically can't get a good sleep schedule. Okay. Mm -hmm. A lot of shift workers. Mm -hmm. Okay. Very high stressed people in general. They, they may not be in a position where they physically can put their bodies under those rigors. doesn't mean they're destined to be um, over, overweight and fat for life, but it means they've got to be a bit more um, realistic about the expectations. And that's a huge thing. People don't have the right expectations set up. And then that's why they do things that are mismatched. They think, I can have it all, I can do it all. I saw Eugene do it on Instagram, I can do this too. And it's like, that's dumb. You can't do that shit because you don't have the lifestyle that I have. Mm -hmm. Like my job is to live, eat, train, sleep. You know, that's, that's I, I can afford to push myself. Whereas if I had to take care of kids, okay, if I had to take care of a very busy swing shift um, emergency services schedule, I can't do that. Mm -hmm. If I was a working mother, I can't do that. I could still get leaner, but I've got to be a little bit more intelligent um, and probably go a little bit slower and also just expect I'm not going to get as much of a result. So the big tactics that I have for people is first, like, just have some kind of mindful plan in place. Like, what are you actually going to be, um, how long are you going to be doing this for? Mm -hmm. Like, I set out knowing it's going to be four weeks max at this super low calories and I expected to lose about five-ish kilos in that time. And I can do the math on that and say, okay, roughly that would equate to this much of a calorie deficit. That's what I should expect to be able to see. Um, I think on average, like a good goal people should shoot for is at absolute most, at absolute most aggressive, is probably going to be about 1% of their body weight per week. And there's going to be wiggle room. Mm -hmm. Some people higher, some people lower. Um, but that's going to be like a good takeaway. So try to shoot for that as a sustainable amount of fat loss. So if you saw in the first... Again, not, not um, like taking away the whole glycogen fluid shifts, but if you saw a 3% drop in your body weight in a week, that tells you it's too hard. 1,000 calories is not good for you. Mm -hmm. You've got to go 1,500. And this is now a tangible thing. If you were dieting and you felt easy, like, yes, it's easy, and you only came down 0.4% of your body weight. Like, okay, you know what? I, I could probably push this a bit harder if I wanted to and just slash away more calories. Yeah. So that's one thing is like set yourself up with like an idea of what you should be expecting to see each week. That's one thing. Um, and then adjust accordingly. Because a thousand calories luckily worked out kind of well for me, but there's a lot of chances that they might not have worked out. I might have had to adjust things mm -hmm. on the fly, which is why having a set goal of like 1% a week, roughly on average, is a good target. I think when you start going above that, it's probably when you start losing it a little bit too quickly, but everybody's different. And that's why like if I was a lot heavier and a lot more body fat, 1% is a much higher number than me at 60 kilos or whatever it is now. Yeah. So that's another takeaway there. Another big thing is, yeah, tactic wise, a thousand calories, it's very hard to get your nutrients in. It's like, on average, it was like 15 grams of fat a day. Mm -hmm. Unless if you're eating table sugar, protein shakes, egg whites, and olive oil, it's hard to get those macros to fit in. You did 15 grams of fat a day? Yeah. Like, which is, which is, which is fucking nuts. No. It's like, it's like maybe a meal at most of the moment, isn't it? It's, 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 it's unrealistic. Ooh. So what I would personally do is I would do a little bit of, um, macro cycling. 
where I'd, I'd bunch up the carbs on one day mm-hmm. or the or into one meal, bunch up more fats on other days to actually make it a feasible, practical plan. And that's going to be another qualifier as well. Like, yeah, like maybe in theory, you could diet on a thousand calories, but practically speaking, it's impossible because if you'd actually hit foods and nutrients and protein requirements, you're going to be blowing over and hitting 1200 instead. That's fine. They'll help you work, work out what it is for you. So yeah, there would be some days where I'd be, uh, or some meals as well, where I'd be going maybe 30 or 40 grams of fat, and then I'd be going um, zero for, the, for other days or yeah. negligible on other days. Um, and there would be instances as well where it's just impractical to be able to follow this without um, creating big issues in the practical aspect of, hey, this is super, super low calories. It's impossible to find nutrient-dense foods that fit into this macro scenario that you need. Um, but the big thing that helped a lot was, yeah, the whole macro cycling where I would go, yeah, certain days where I was training probably, higher carbs, less fat. Other days where I'm not training, higher fat, pretty much zero carbs, like some vegetables and that was it. Mm-hmm. Um, and then doing my best to try to hit those protein needs as well. But again, I think people people overstate how much protein you really need, yeah. even when dieting. And like I was eating about 0.82 grams per pound of body weight, okay. which is not much. For me, at that size is about 120, 140-ish grams on average of protein, which is really not that much protein. Yeah. Um, that's what I eat most of the time to be able to maintain and grow muscle mass. I think people overeat it and it's not really helping them. Not necessarily hurting, but it is hurting in terms of how much carbs and fats you can then fit in because it's still calories, you know? Um, so I think for, some, for whatever reason, we just obsess with too much protein and mm. it can be problematic. The protein thing is actually quite interesting because not that obviously, you know, four, cal- uh, four calories per gram, right? Mm. But when we, we talk to Alan Aragon about this, one thing that you'll see anecdotally from a lot of people who do den- tend to diet on high protein diets who count, especially within bodybuilding is like maybe even towards the middle or end of their prep, they'll go cr- like two grams per pound, right? Mm. And they'll find that they're not gaining extra weight if they only increase the protein amounts. Um, mm. Alan Aragon's talked about this on the show before yeah. where he, it's iffy, but he was like, you know, s- individuals sometimes just increase protein within their diet um and it's almost like it doesn't metabolically make a difference in terms Mm. of their rate uh rate of loss like they'll continue to lose body fat increase their protein so they're more satiated yeah but it doesn't make a difference as if they increase carbohydrates or if they increased fat Mm. so protein's kind of weird in that way because i mean a lot of people that diet notice that you know yeah um so i i I would think that there would be a benefit of slightly higher protein for individuals mm-hmm. who need the satiating benefit, yeah. but still want to be able to have that fat loss benefit over time. Yeah, but yeah, for sure. Like I, I tend to agree with that. Like I'm, I'm really not smart enough to, be able to understand all the complexities of it. Yeah. Um, but I've heard of that from him and from many other people as well, and um, and it makes a lot of sense. Like it is physiologically very expensive and hard for your body to use protein mm-hmm. as a fuel source. So that's pro- that makes sense as to why increasing it may not have the same effects as increasing fat or carbohydrates. Yeah. Um, I personally haven't, ex- haven't played with it myself to be able to say for sure what happens. And I haven't seen enough from like clients, people I work with to be able to see yes or no, but definitely would be a strategy you can play with. So I think it's a, it's, it it's makes perfect sense. And if the guy like Alan Aragon is supporting it and a lot of other evidence-based people are supporting it as well. So yeah, yeah. knock yourself out. Yeah. Um, it, Maybe let's say that it did slow down the rate of things. Who cares? You know, if you're still if you're still moving towards where you want to move towards and it's sustainable for you, go for it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Did you eat more than once a day? Yeah, I was still having maybe three, maybe four meals a day. Mm-hmm. Um, they weren't. I call them meals. meals? <laughs> I call them meals, but, <laughs> but but we know they're not meals. It's it's a light snack. <laughs> well, what it's did like, you have? I'm curious. Like, what was it? Like, was bland. It was very lean proteins, like a chicken breast or, or like a fish kind of thing. It was mm-hmm. very very lean. <sighs> a bit of vegetables, maybe a piece of fruit of like piece or whatever the equivalent is depending on a slice have. of an apple <laughs> have you ever um, tried to um, just the peel <laughs> have you ever tried some like intermittent fasting and stuff yeah like that? so i would do time restricted feeding with that so i still try, I try if i have like three or two meals a day some days it seems like eating every other day would make sense yeah with the yeah program alternate like day this. fasting that would be a great way because yeah if because if, all we care about is the average across the right. week if you're in this thousand calorie day thing so some people definitely tactic wise could do intermittent fasting they could do a one day 24 hour fast 36 hour fast alternate day day on day off whatever you want to call it they're all strategies to help you adhere to the extreme diet you put yourself on. And that's fine. And then like a way that I would do that, which I've, which I've done with some people is saying, okay, we're going to do alternate day fasting. Um, just make the off days when you're training, 
fasting days. And then in ways mm-hmm. you, you don't fast, you can train, you can push hard and you adequately feel you're satiated. And that mentally helps some people because yeah, they can just get through it that way. Everyone's different. But then for me, this fit well. And there were some days like, cause I, I can very easily just forget to eat. Mm-hmm. So there were days where it was like maybe, maybe two meals a day. I don't think I've went below two, um, but it's very easy for me to just to forget to eat. And that is also like a problematic thing because eating so few calories, you for sure are risking muscle loss. Mm. Has that sure. been a thing for you for like a long time? Like you could sometimes just forget to eat or um, is this? It's, um, it's more just as I get busier with work. Yeah. Ah. I keep myself preoccupied okay. or like I'll be like playing guitar and I'll just be lost in like six hours of playing guitar. I'm like, okay, <laughs> didn't eat. I won't feel hunger because I'll be doing be something else. You know, or if I, if I go out and like going for a swim or like diving or whatever, you just, you don't eat. You can't practically do it. So Another tactic, I guess, it's good that you guys bring this up, is like, keep yourself fucking busy. Yeah. <laughs> if, like, it could be work, it could be whatever, hobbies, family, who knows what. But just, and that applies again to aggressive diet and a regular casual diet. It's just find things to um, keep you occupied. Um, yeah, but yeah, I think probably part of it also is just for me bodybuilding, where like that made me less emotionally attached to food. But yeah, I mean, you guys know, like, if like, even doing, doing a podcast like this, you might get a bit hungry, but you're not thinking about food that much. I think you made other shit. Like I, I could, when I was doing, when I do my workshops, I usually don't eat. And that'll mm-hmm. be like several days in a row, eight hour, 10 hour days, I don't eat. And I'm doing active stuff, but I'm too engaged to be thinking about that. And when it comes like a break time, I'm physically not hungry because I'm so thinking about other stuff. And that's for like, that's a big reason why I lost a lot of muscle when I was on tour for so long a few years ago is because I'd go like nine months on end and I'd be barely eating. Mm-hmm. Cause I'd just be teaching and traveling and seeing the world and doing other shit. So I'm not thinking about training or eating so much. But just forget about it. Just to reiterate something with what you said, when you're doing these things, you still have those pumps of hunger during certain parts, sure. but it passes, it passes and you yeah. continue to do what you need to do. Yeah. You know, yeah. I, I think that's a really big deal what you mentioned because it's very, very easy for a lot of people to just get bored mm. and then they, you know, they're, they're doing something, they're bored they reach for something, right? Yeah. But if you yeah. do keep yourself busy with something that you truly enjoy, that can that in and of itself is a habit to be able to mm. maintain not just health for a long period of time, but any type of diet you're doing. But if you're not busy and you're not doing anything during your day, it's going to be very easy to just stuff some shit in your mouth. Yeah. You know, I think um, thinking out loud, one thing you mentioned before was like you used um, fasting as a way to help to train away that attachment to food and always needing it. I think that actually could be something useful for some people, like not necessarily fasting, but having, having practice diets to train up your system to be able to handle a more aggressive diet or even just dieting in general, mm-hmm. whether it's aggressive or a, sh- a small long-term diet. Let's not look at, I want to lose weight in 12 weeks and say, I want to practice the art, the skill of losing fat and dieting for the next two weeks. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to drop a ton of body fat, but I just want to practice a bit of fasting or a bit of a calorie deficit. And just so I get, I get the skill set because this is dieting is a skill. Mm. It's a skill set that, that we try to, we throw people into the deep and saying, next 20 weeks, calorie fucking deficit. You're going to drop some <laughs> shit and get shredded. That's putting someone onto fucking advanced mode in the game. Like maybe you've got to do a beginner tutorial. Mm-hmm. A couple of weeks, let's <laughs> do a little bit of yeah, a practice run of a diet. Set the expectation and say, well, here's what we're going to be getting out of it and play with that. That's actually, yeah. I'm going to write that down for later. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds great. Yeah. yeah. Is there anything for, um, I'll say lighter guys, because you said you were mm-hmm. uh, one. 40, I don't know how to convert kilos over. Uh, Roughly but, double it. But yeah. Okay. Um, just, Cause I'm just thinking like if somebody is already fairly light mm. and they want to get shredded or they yeah. want to, you know, lose some, some body fat, what's something that you caution some of these athletes with? Um, so, I mean, it, it does get to a point where it's um, just unhealthy. Mm-hmm. Like if you are, like you can be light and have a lot of body fat on your body. And that's where like, technically speaking, you are got a lot of body fat, you should be able to lose a lot of fat. But that would also mean for you to be able to lose a lot of fat, you've got to be in a big diet and a big deficit. That would then mean it's now impossible for you to feasibly get enough nutrients in, enough protein in. So no matter what the numbers say in terms of what you physically can do, it's impractical because it puts you into stu- too steep of a restriction of food, which means restriction of fiber, a restriction of protein, amino acids, nutrients, and that's where it becomes problematic. And that's for a lot of women as well. Like a lot of women in theory, there's no reason why they can't do a diet like this, apart from the fact that they're, they're, they're lighter humans. Mm. So that means that their technical, like for me eating a thousand calories, for them it may actually work out for the numbers to be 500 calories, you know, which like there are diets out there that do that. There's some of those OptiFast slim shakes or whatever mm. that they are there. But we know that 
for a woman or a man to be eating so few calories, it's going to be impossible to hit your protein needs to support training. And it's going to be impossible to hit the basic nutrient needs for overall health. And even for three to four weeks, that may not be a good idea for some people. It may be too hard. So I would say just be mindful of the practicality, despite what numbers or despite what I may say, it may not, even, it may not be feasible for them because of yeah, what, what it really means they have to do. So it sounds to me like basically in a 12-week period, you got X amount of calories to play with no matter how you slice it. Yeah, yeah. And then I would prefer to take them away f earlier than yeah. later. People take them away later. I was like, well, why do that? You know, don't. Do it. We do it when you have the fat available in your body mm. and make it come off faster. Helps with morale as well. You drop a ton of fat in the first few weeks, you're like, fuck yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll keep pushing, if you, even if it does suck a little bit. And then it increases as you get leaner and start to suffer a bit more. I mean, it's, in my opinion, that sounds a lot more sustainable. Did you guys have any other questions about diet? Because there's something I want to go, go for. for it. Okay. Segue. <laughs> yeah. Um, your testosterone. Because, <laughs> <laughs> no, no. This yeah. is really interesting because I like whenever we have uh, some people that come on and, and uh, they, you know, their hormone talk starts, I bring you up quite a bit because you've talked about where your testosterone levels are, but you hold a lot of muscle on your frame. And a lot of individuals, a lot, especially young guys, are the belief that if you have a certain amount of testosterone, um, you're not like, you're going to need to hop on TRT to build muscle. All right. Which, yeah, yeah. to be perfectly honest, I think is bullshit, especially when you're young. But for you, it's gonna like, be hard to see. But what number one? What were your levels at? Were you surprised by seeing that? Was it when you were really lean or something? Or like, what? What yeah. is that to you? Unfortunately, I've never had like a, a test when I was very, very young to know like where my like real baseline is at. Um, but on average, my testosterone has always been the lower end of normal, mm -hmm. always, and um, it it hasn't like definitely now hasn't impacted my ability to get stronger to make progress i am absolutely sure that if my if you take me as i am right now and then you somehow magically increase my testosterone magically we know what that means <laughs> 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 even if it just went to the the high end of normal mm -hmm. okay i am absolutely confident that would improve everything in my life okay like my vitality would probably go up i'd build muscle easier for sure mm -hmm. i'm sure that would happen Okay, like, because we know, like, physiologically how testosterone works, of course it's going to help you. It's going to make a difference there. Um, but does it mean that I'm at a humongous disadvantage right now? Does it matter? Okay, I don't have the competitive goal of being the biggest, strongest guy on earth. I'm able to maintain muscle mass, and there's no reason, like, like testosterone does help, but adding in more and more and more isn't always going to help. Mm -hmm. Again, like, we know that from a lot of people using a lot of gear. Upping the dose doesn't always make you lift the most. It's, it's going to have diminishing returns. It's going to have a lot of side effects to it as well. Um, so, like, I know, like, this is roughly normal for me, like, this low end of normal-ish. If it was, like, gutter ball low, then I'm probably going to feel like shit. And I'm probably mm. going to have a lot of issues as well. But for me, with my physiology, this seems to be okay, or I can function and I can, I can thrive. Not just, I don't want to say function, like, I'm just keeping a head <laughs> above water. Yeah. But this is where it, it sits comfortably. Whether I'm in a surplus, whether I'm at maintenance, whether I'm dieting aggressively, it hovers around that kind of range. Mm -hmm. um, and everyone's going to be different. Like some people may feel like shit at this range and they need to be higher. Some people may, may, may get over being lower. And this is where it's a very personal thing. That's why it's very hard to, um, I think, prescribe certain amounts or certain levels as being optimal. This is not definitely not my wheelhouse, so I can't speak from that perspective to gen pop as, or, yeah. or anybody in general um, as like what the ideal hormonal status is. Um, but for sure, it's like every, I know for sure everyone's going to be different. Everyone's going to have different physiology around what makes them thrive and what helps them feel okay as well. Mm -hmm. But there's also, we've got to look beyond the physiology. Okay, of just what are your test levels at? It's also about what is your psychology around your test levels? Okay, like I'm indifferent. I could have seen a number there that was through the roof or I could have seen a number there that was gullib or low and I'm indifferent. I'm like, cool, whatever. I care more about how I feel. Some people, they see a number like that psychologically placebo, oh, I've got to feel like shit now. Oh, I'm going to start like get no libido, you know? Mm -hmm. Like how much of it is physiologi physiological, physiological, <laughs> how much of it is psychological? Yeah. And that's a huge thing where I personally, just based on my background, based on my history, based on my knowledge, I am able for the most part to remain quite pragmatic and level-headed around it all where it doesn't freak me out. And that's why like I can personally afford to be at this lower test without being so upset and freaked out about, but I know a lot of other people would. And they say, mm. oh my God, you cracked your hormones. Like, no, it's not it's where it normally sits. But again, like I, again, I do know that I probably would be better if I had higher testosterone. I might be more muscular. I might be 
um, able to handle more training volume. Who knows? Um, but for where I'm at now, I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm fun. I'm progressing. I'm able to maintain my physique and make progress there. I'm able to die without suffering. I'm able to have energy, have got a good, lib- got a good libido, good performance in everyday life, good energy levels. I'm doing everything right there. Yeah. Um, I'm good. Um, yeah, that's about it with, with the levels. So I think one thing, big takeaway for people is like not obsessing over those numbers. If you're in the extremes, maybe something it can be amiss and blood mm-hmm. work is something we can analyze and say, okay, here's where there may be issues or non-issues or whatever. Um, but again, a little bit of information can be a very dangerous thing. Yeah. We see one number, we obsess over that number without understanding the context in which the number occurs and how the number can influence psychology and how that is a very big player where it is our perception on things that does play out to a lot of placebo effects, which we know is a real is a real tangible thing. Mm-hmm. Um, so the better that we can be equipped knowledge-wise to be able to handle that and navigate that, I think the better. And of course, like I'm still going to do my best to optimize my testosterone. I'm still going to care about resistance training. I'm still going to care about sleep and nutrition and making sure I don't do stupid things that would compromise my testosterone because I don't want to see it low for the sake of being low. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I'd, still like see, I'd love to see it higher. It'd be great to see it higher. Let's take some steroids now. Let's do it. <laughs> it'd be really interesting to know, like, you know, if there is a correlation amongst people that are natural with muscle mass and testosterone. Like, it doesn't, doesn't seem to really make a big difference. There's a lot of guys that are mm. low that are, jacked as fuck and vice versa absolutely i i kind of have a theory uh which i just i think that just to a certain extent i mean we're all very different uh especially when you get into the chemistry of what's going on in our body for Mm -hmm. a million different reasons but i kind of think in terms that would be said better than this but i basically think that you kind of use it up I think that it gets utilized, you know, like um, a little bit like carbohydrates. Now, it might mm-hmm. sound like an asinine thing to say, but yeah. I think that your body is only going to produce the amounts that it needs. Mm-hmm. And each person, I think, reacts a little different to uh, testosterone, estrogen, and, and all these different things. And I think based on all the stuff that you do in a day, uh, all the way from stuff in the gym to stuff in the bedroom to the things that we watch and the things that we I mean, stress, we know like what stress can mm. kind of change the hormones. And uh, we know that there's certain things like that you can do that all of a sudden uh, tells the body to produce more testosterone. So I kind of think in some weird way uh, through the physical stuff that we do, through the stresses that we do, that testosterone is going up and down, up and down, up and down. But because every action <laughs> has another reaction, right? All your other markers are moving up and down. And we don't know what that is yet. Yeah. And when we do, I think we can put that into a super shot and we can all get really <laughs> fucking jacked. But I don't think we know like how to stabilize the rest because I think that yeah. you could actually make steroids. I think you could make them very, very safe. For sure. If, if things filled in the, the cracks of Absolutely. all the other stuff you're producing and you didn't have these highs and lows all the time. Absolutely. So that's kind of my bro science it. version of it. <laughs> I like it. I like it. I mean, I'm all for the bro science. I love that. But it's a really good way of putting things. I really do. Really, yeah, that resonates. What you got, Andrew? Anything else over there? Um, no, I think we're all good. Uh, let's see what I have. Oh, yeah, I already asked you about the diet for for the uh, lighter weight guys, but no, I mean the um, the the re- I don't, is that reverse dieting or is that something different about like cutting? Reverse dieting is a little different. Out of a diet. Yeah, yeah, a little different than what he's uh, laying. Okay, out. but that the whole thing concept, I I've never heard it. It sounds it's got me a little excited. I'm not going to do it because <laughs> when I get this excited, I'm going to I'll be one of those guys that's just like oh, oh he he messed me up, but. I mean, everyone has different names for it. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I know um, I recently saw Lane Norton. He calls it, um, he's, he calls it fat loss sprints. Mm-hmm. He's oh, got, okay. He did a post about it relatively recently. Um, Martin McDonald from over in the UK, he calls it aggressive dieting and he does a similar kind of concept where it's like you lose as much fat as you can as quickly as possible and then that will change. The leaner you get, you can't lose as much fat anymore so you can't diet as hard. Um, so it's it's out there. It's mm-hmm. out there. And it is it does seem kind of counter um to the mainstream. Um, but it actually is based on the exact same principles. It is still mm-hmm. calories in, calories out. As you mm-hmm. said, we have twelve weeks, X amount of calories, manipulate it however you want. And then it makes a lot of sense from a psychological and a physiological perspective to go fucking ham from the start when you can afford to and then be a little more gentle, gentle to yourself mm-hmm. when you're leaner. And then I would probably say that would probably preserve things like testosterone or whatever because you're going to get lots of that, a lot less of that stress accumulation when you really need it, uh, when you don't want it, sorry, at the end of the diet. 
Yeah. yeah. And this is, I guess, maybe one of the last questions. Who are some people, because you're, you, you learn a lot from a lot of different people. That's what yeah. you've seen. And you teach a lot to a lot of different people. So who are some people that you really re respect some of the things that they're putting out that you think they're putting out a lot of beneficial things as far as it, it doesn't need to be bodybuilding, but just in general, fitness, health, et cetera. Who are some people you pay attention to? Um, nutritionally, Dr. Ben House is a, is a fucking smart dude. Ben House? Ben House, yeah. Okay. I like it because he's, he's a doctor. He's a Dr. House. <laughs> yeah, I like. I love that show, actually. <laughs> um, Dr. Ben House, he, he's a fantastic dude around the whole nutrition space. And that's a lot of the coaching kind of space and mindset. Um, I love his work. Um, I, I obviously like Dr. Mike Isretal. He's a guy I've followed for a very, very yeah. long time. Um, and I love a lot of what he puts out from the muscle building side of things. Um, let's say like the women's physiology, there'd be uh, Victoria Felkar. She's up in Canada. Um, she's she, She's been very quiet on social media the last few years, but there was a time when she was really pushing out a lot of um, really, really insightful content. Like she was, she's, um, I may be misquoting it, but she was um, doing her PhD when I first met her um, on the use of performance enhancements or steroids in general for women. Um, not just for performance enhancing, like to make you better at sport, but just the whole thing behind like um, how steroids impact women's physiology. Mm. And that could be anabolic steroids, but it could also be things like the contraceptive pill, which is technically a steroid hormone as well. Yeah. And like some of the impact that that may have on different women's physiologies. She's a really, really cool person on that. Um, who else would there be? Um, from a training perspective, I think uh, there's a guy, Cassim Hansen from over in Colorado. He's N1 training. Oh, uh, uh, really, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, he, he, brings up, he brings up a lot of the um, – <laughs> his – he comes around a lot because people talk about like the optimal and the biomechanics, the alignment, but I think he's doing a lot of really good work. And yeah. he's, he's really, really good at um, like getting into the, the deep like nuances and nitpicking and saying, this is like why this may be a little bit better than that. And I think, yeah, for sure, for some people, it may, it may be overkill, but for what he does and what he specializes in, it's incredible work. And he really knows how to push people hard and get an incredible result. He's, he's, a, he's a real savant when it comes to a lot of the physiology stuff as well. Mm. Um, Mentioned Luke Lehman as well. He's um he's based in Australia now. He was from he was from Texas, um, over at Muscle Nerds. He's a, he's a really smart dude, really smart guy. Because okay. there's a lot of really cool people that I just honestly I learned from. Like th there's some names who I know are creators, but there are um just I learned from every single person I can. My students in my classes, um like I'm technically above them in inverted commas, um but I still want to learn from them. I still mm -hmm. want to even even if it's just them saying, you know what, Eugene. You just talked about that dieting process. I don't understand it. I don't get it. That's a good thing for me to help me learn how to communicate it better, how to yeah. make it more succinct. Like even things like this, like you've asked me a lot of really cool questions. This is going to help me learn to help to refine my process more. It's like, hey, this is stuff that you guys care about, people care about. So I want to get better at communicating that or maybe changing things up or different ideas. It's, it's a constant process mm -hmm. of learning from everybody. Andrew, take us on out of here, buddy. Absolutely. Thank you, everybody, for checking out today's episode. We sincerely appreciate it. Uh, please make sure you guys hit that like button and drop us a comment down below on anything you guys heard today. Uh, let me know if you guys are going to uh, try this, um, this this diet approach that I personally have never really heard. So, um, yeah, I would like to know more. And uh, please follow the podcast at MB Project on Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter. My Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter is at I am Andrew Z. And Seema, where are you at? And Seema Inyo on Instagram and YouTube. And Seema Yinyo on TikTok and Twitter. Eugene Gunbar Method. You guys have like oh, like tens of thousands of members and tons of programs. <laughs> yeah. So how can people check that out? And what like what is it? We didn't even get to really talk about yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah, how dare I thought it was gonna be a big plug. I thought it was gonna be a fair <laughs> plug for me to be able to say, use my discount code for this program. Um I mean, I always tell people I don't like to push things on people. I say, look, look at my content, look at my Instagram, like just coach agency, look at my YouTube. If you enjoy that stuff, you'll probably enjoy the way that I approach training, the programs I have, and the educational approach that I take. So Gambari Method is my platform to be able to share my education in longer form content um, and all of my different programs and applications of all those principles. Um, it is a complete, pretty much complete all-in-one system of programming, um, programs, diet calculators, so things like the aggressive diet. It'll tell you how to manipulate your calories accordingly over a four to eight week period. Mm -hmm. um, it has a diet tracker in there. It is just, a, and it's a big community of, yeah, tens of thousands of people who are just working towards a variety of goals from different levels. Yeah. At first, when I first launched it many years ago, it was an educational platform for coaches. And then over time, it's evolved and become this programming, training, um, tracker, platform thing where it brings in people from a variety of backgrounds. Like a lot of gen pop people are in there. A lot of very advanced high level coaches and high level athletes are in there as well. And it's great because they can all 
know, we're all the same, we're all the same human being. We can all mm -hmm. progress towards the same kind of thing. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a very complete system in my opinion. Cool. Very biased opinion, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but some people look, just find me on Instagram, find me on YouTube, follow that stuff. Don't even worry about Gambo Method right now. Just enjoy, if you want, what I put out and um, go from there. Nice. Is it my turn? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm at Mark Smelly Bell. Strength is never weakness. Weakness is never strength. Catch you guys later. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>